reach five billion in tax collection, sales tax collection, the next two and a half billion goes to transportation to the transportation fund, and that was approved by the voters of Texas. So we fill the bucket to five, two and a half billion goes to transportation, the next two and a half billion, and then we come back and the rest comes back into GR. So um, th there are lots of ways that you can do it um, and dedicate, you can dedicate sales tax, you can dedicate um, one-time money like general revenue or um, rainy day fund money. Um, so there's a lot of talk about all of that. Um, having worked in the legislative branch for 20 plus years, um, I, the leg it's the legislature's decisions. We are not the policy makers. We just, we just provide information and resources and data to them. But it's a really difficult decision. And I've sat behind members of the legislature for a long time um, during sessions where there was no money and sessions where there was money. And I will tell you the sessions where there is no money are a whole lot easier because the answer is the same to everyone. No, there's no money. The sessions where there's money, and especially the sessions where there's a lot of money, are a lot more difficult because the members of the legislature have to pick the winners and losers, and they have to decide who gets that money and how much. And um, everybody has their hand out right now. They're seeing that top line number, and they're thinking that they have an extra $33 billion to play with, and they don't. They're not going to be able to spend that whole amount. Um, and there are lots of great proposals out there. We're hearing a lot of them. They, they think we make the decisions. We don't. We just have the money. But we've been able to hear a lot of the proposals. And I have, I've been on the other side of it in, in the legislative arena. And I can tell you that everyone that comes in has a compelling story to tell and a reason why the money should be spent on, on their issue. And so it, it really is a very difficult um, decision for the legislature. Eighty percent of the budget is formulaic. It's uh, revenue that's dedicated or um, has federal matches to it, and so there's only about 20 percent of it that's discretionary, but that is the 20 percent they fight about the whole session, and this is the budget is the only thing they have to do every session. They're required to do. There's 9,000 other bills. Those are all gravy. They are great if they happen. But the only thing that they have to do every session is pass a budget. And they will keep coming back until they pass a budget. Um, and it is... It started months ago, and it will be one of the last things they do during this session because that 20%, and you all know the saying, devil's in the details, is where um, you know all the back and forth is happening. So um, it really is um, an all-encompassing kind of um, uh, job for, uh, for the folks that are writing that budget. Um, you know, Texas, 10th largest economy in the world, it is still amazing to me that we do a two-year, um, we, we're only in session every other year in a state the size of Texas. We do a two-year budget. Um, it, you know, that just blows my mind still to this day, um, but that is the cycle that we're on. So we are writing a two-year budget um, with a great deal of uncertainty um, surrounding it. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, Glenn, Glenn talked a little bit about some of the priorities for the legislature. Um, he will be um, testifying before Senate Finance on Monday. I'm sure he's going to be asked about what his recommendations would be for how they spend some of that money. So I'm just going to, I know that you're going to ask me that, so I'm going to cut you off and give you the answer ahead of time. So um, in his layout of the BRE, um, some of the things that he mentioned that he thought were worthy for consideration for the legislature were investments in our electrical grid, broadband con connectivity, port and water infrastructure, salary adjustments for state workers, teachers and nurses, um, development of our skilled trade workforce. Those are things that we see on the horizon as um, good long-term investments for the economic benefit to the state of Texas. He also mentioned um, border security as important place to spend some of the money, um, the expenses associated with the folks coming in over the border, especially for, especially for local governments who are absorbing the majority of that expense. Um, and then finally, um, meaningful tax reduction 
to ease the burden for Texans who are just um, feeling the weight of inflation, the economic uncertainty, and rising housing costs. We are working with the leadership right now to figure out how to do a something that is um, long-term and sustainable in terms of property tax relief. The last thing they want to do is give property tax relief and then have to take it away in a couple years if we are in a deep recession or the money's not available. And so um, one thing that Glenn has really um, been talking to his colleagues about is tap the brakes, don't go crazy and try to spend all of this money because this is one-time money. This is not what. This is not the new norm. We don't expect to have these kind of revenue con con collections in a couple of years. So we need to be thoughtful and we need to be able to sustain whatever you do um, as far as tax relief. So one of the things that we're looking at and trying to figure out right now um, is a mechanism to take a large portion of this money and put it in the property tax relief fund without appropriating it so it won't um, count against the spending limit, but have it available for property tax relief in the future so that if the economy takes a downturn, you have a pot of money you could turn to and continue to provide that property tax relief. Um, so I can talk about ideas we're hearing on all of that um, as we go. Um, you know, we always caveat everything. Uh, you know, I feel like a commercial, but, you know, there's a lot of things that could um, impact um, uh, what, what we see over the next two years. We will be talking to legislatures, the legislators and the leadership offices um, about, you know, what we're seeing on the horizon so they can make adjustments as we see things change. But, you know, the uh, we still have supply chain issues, and um, we think some of those are going to ease now that China has lifted some of their COVID restrictions, but there's still a backlog on um, um, getting goods and services, and it's going to take a little time for that to ease. Um, you know, we have we have a war in Ukraine that is affecting uh, a, a lot of global supply chains. Uh, there's some energy issues that are associated with that, and so there are. Um, you know, we're, we're not isolated in Texas. We are we are tied to the nations and the global economy. So we um, we do. Um, we, we are trying to caution the legislature about what we see on the horizon and, and making sure that they make prudent decisions. Don't go crazy with all that um, money. We do have a large savings account, the largest in the nation. Um, uh, we we do have the ability to invest part of the rainy day fund um, that was given to the, the legislature under Controller Hager's um, at his request, but under his um, uh, uh, purview. Um, you know, high interest rates are good for us when we're investing eighty billion dollars, um, but high interest rates are not good if you want to go buy a new home or a car or those kinds of things. And so there's a push pull in all of these. Um, in all of these things. And so um, our, our investment strategy um, with the things that we have, we have, and we have the tobacco settlement money, we have SWIFT, we have part of the ESF, we have Textpool and Textpool Prime. So we have a large um, a balance that we are investing. It's very diversified. We are not swinging for the fences on those things. We're trying to meet inflation and make a little bit of money. Prior to being able to invest that money, um, we weren't even keeping up with inflation on, on that money, and that's when inflation was at 2%. So, um, uh, you know, Glenn's pitch to the legislature was it's, it was tantamount to burying it in the ground at the Capitol. Um, we need to make that money work for the citizens of Texas, and every dollar we make through investment is a dollar we don't have to raise in taxes. And so that is um, just kind of smart money management, and that's um, the approach that we've taken um, at the office. So I think that's um, kind of the it for my high level, maybe a little too much detail. I can't help myself with some of those numbers, but um, uh, I'm happy to take questions about um, what we're seeing or any of the things we do at our office. Um, we, we do a lot of different things besides collect taxes, so I'm happy to talk about any of the, or do the revenue estimate. Questions? What? Okay. I know, I, come on. Throw me a softball. Okay. 
It is. I mean, I've been through those sessions before where they, you know, tout, you know, billions of dollars in property tax relief. And you're like, oh, I got $20 on my bill. And that wasn't. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, they've done a couple things that, over the last couple sessions to try to compress the rate. Um, and, uh, and I think it's working. I think a lot of people saw not huge decreases, but decreases in their school taxes. Um, values are up, but the rates are down. And I think that's, um, you know, what they're trying to do is compress those rates. So I've heard a couple of different ideas that are out there. One would be just increasing the homestead exemption, which is easy, right? The mechanism already exists. All you got to do is increase the amount. That's, that's pretty easy. The state buys that down. Um, you know, there's been some talk about, um, checks to individuals, to homeowners, you know, just a flat payment, very complicated. Um, not only would we have to run all those checks, um, which would be hard to do, um, you get into all kind of federal income tax uh, problems really fast because if it's over a certain amount, it is taxable income. And so we're just like, oh, that, that just gets so complicated. Then we're going to have to send everybody a, a, a tax form and, you know, on top of that. So, um, but they're still talking about um, that. Um, th they're talking about a little more compression on the rates um, to try to even that out. Um, you know, the school finance formula, and I like to say, Property tax is not a state tax. We do not administer property tax. We do 60 t fees and taxes, not property tax. Um, sales tax is our big one. Um, but the, the formula is set up to where the local property tax in your school finance bucket fills it up first, and then the state fills up the remainder amount. And what was happening was it was getting, the, the, the local portion was getting higher and higher and the state portion was getting lower and lower. And so what they tried to do um, through the compression was even that out. And their goal is to try to get to more of a 50-50 um, I don't know if it'll ever quite get there, but to get those more in line so it's not an 80-20. Um, and so that the state is got a bigger um, piece of that and and feels more compelled to put more money in it. And so that is kind of that's kind of the goal with the property taxes to try to get it to more of that even amount. I don't know what they'll end up doing. Um, I mean, we, we're looking at putting a big chunk billions into that property tax relief fund is what Glenn is advocating. They could appropriate and spend some of it now and then have it there so that that continues so that you don't get a reduction and then get a big increase the next time. That would not be popular. Those members would not be back in the pink building if they did that. And so, and they know it, so they don't want to do anything like that. So yes, sir. No. <laughs> uh, um, no. Um, I haven't heard any, and full disclosure, Glenn Hager is a farmer. Um, that's, that is his profession. Um, no, I mean, Texas is fundamentally a property rights state, and we, uh, we, you know, we hold on to our identity as a rural agriculture state, um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, if Yellowstone could be filmed in Texas, they would. You know, they just like that whole um, that, that whole idea of we are a rural agriculture state. And so I just, that identity is too ingrained, I think, that for them to come back and try to do that. And also, it's hard to take things away once you give them. You know, once you have given a benefit, it's hard to pull that benefit back. And so um, absent some way to glide people off of it or even it out I just don't I just don't know how they would um how they would do it so yes
specifically how much of the actual murder and death penalty says this or not. Maybe 50% per year of the death penalty balances out with ebb and flow of how the economy goes. Instead of just brutalizing all property owners and even commercial and paying them this 400% interest to pay the taxes and say, no, you can do this over a period of years, say 30%, whatever you can Yeah, um, it's complicated. Um, well, and and there's this there's this uh, between the state and the locals because it is a local tax, and we have a constitutional prohibition against a statewide property tax. So there's all of these things like you can't do that because then it could be seen as a state tax instead of a local tax. And so there there's you know this this push and pull on all of it. Um, the other thing that the legislature did when they created that formula is um, they were worried that appraisal districts would try to game the system and under appraise, and they do, and so they, they put in statute that they have to appraise at market value. And so that is... Um, you know, that's the push and pull, right? You don't want your property taxes to go up, but if somebody offered you that for your house, you'd be like, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the, the market is driving a lot of that, and we are seeing that across the state. Um, you know, Austin, I'm sure it's, it's bleeding into Bastrop, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. The housing costs are astronomical, but what's happening is folks are selling their homes in California, and they're coming here and getting a bargain and driving up the cost. And so that is just um, you know, what's happening across our state. We have, um, you know, during the pandemic, we saw more net um, movement into Texas from places like New York and California than any other state. They were getting out of the big cities and wanted to come to, you know, smaller areas. And so it drove up all the housing costs. And so it's, you know, it's one of those like, how do you, how do you fix that um, without, you know, some kind of state check on everybody? And so I don't, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. And property tax is not my area of expertise, not a, not a state tax. The prices do go up, but they're limited to how much. How much, yeah. yeah. Never, never, it never goes down. It only goes up. Yeah. It's a, it's a one way street. Right. And the, the other thing I, I mentioned to a group, I spoke to a group of businesses, um, the other day, um, is whenever the legislature talks about property tax relief, that's for homeowners, um, businesses will also want something um, in that. And so um, how, how you, you know, if you increase the homestead exemption, that doesn't help businesses. And so um, the other thing they have to grapple with is then what do we do for businesses in Texas? And so um, that is the, the other piece that they have to fund and figure out. And so um, because they, 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 they don't want to do one without the other. And so... Um, they don't have an answer. I don't know what it is yet, but devil's in the details. I guess we'll be figuring that out. Yes, sir.
Yeah, because we can't keep up with the housing and you have the supply chain issues and all of those stuff. That was one of the things, too, when they were looking at individual um checks or reimbursements for property tax renters and businesses and how you how you do you know do you give it to the building owner are they going to pass it on to their tenants that you know that was all part of the um discussion of you know how do you make that go it had a lot other i mean it had a lot of bigger problems than just that but it had a lot of um uh you know there's just a lot of um rabbit holes that we went down on on those kinds of things i you know i don't know the answer and luckily i'm not the policymaker, and i don't have to so um i don't i don't know how to fix it i and and if it was easy they would have done it a long time ago um so that's the other thing okay i think she's telling me i got uh time for a couple more questions oh yes ma'am oh oh okay sorry sorry I, I don't I don't know um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know um, Monday he goes before Senate Finance to to do a, a presentation on the BRE the numbers I just gave you he'll go into a little more detail um, on um, uh, you know some of the subcategories beyond sales tax for them because they, they like that stuff um, and then he's um, going to roll into our budget so we are just like even though we have all the money we are just like every other state agency with our handout over there asking for money to fund our operations um, an advantage we have it's twofold um, we certify the budget at the end of the process before it goes to the governor um, to make sure that they stayed within their parameters so we have a certification hammer on the end um, we also bring in all the revenue for the state of texas and so if we can't um keep our people and pay our people we can't bring in the revenue i mean our our our, our employees are directly tied to how much revenue the state of texas have and if we can't hire qualified people and provide good customer service then we can't bring in the revenue and uh, you know a lot of our stuff is on voluntary compliance we're not going to audit every business in the state of texas but we we have to have resources available to answer their questions so they know how to do what they need to do and so we're in austin we're competing against google and facebook for employees and i tell our folks all the time you're not going to sit on a bouncy ball at the controller's office. Like, we don't have that. Um, uh, you know, it's, we're not that fancy. Um, but we're, we're trying to lean into the things that we do well, which is work-life balance. We had a, a robust telework program before telework was cool, pre-pandemic. We were teleworking. We're hybrid now. Everybody's in three days a week. They're out two days a week. I mean, we have folks that live a long way away and telecommute it, or, uh, commute in three days a week, but it's doable because it's only three days. And so, um, and, and then just the public service aspect of what we do. You get to serve your fellow Texans every day, and you get to feel good about that when you go home at night. That is, um, you know, part of what what we do and that we're really proud of and so we're just leaning into those things and trying to compete against google and facebook with without the bouncy balls um and so uh, uh but we are losing our audit and enforcement staff we provide the best training in the state we you know you will get trained on all 60 fees and taxes in a three-year program and you will know it and you can go work in a lot of different places and make a lot more money because of that training that we provide. If we don't keep that training pipeline going, we're not gonna have, you know, we're not gonna be able to sustain our collections and, and this kind of, you know, report to the legislature. Um, so th that's it. So, so we'll be asking for our budget. Um, he will get asked by members of the legislature, what do you think we should spend the money on? And those are the priorities that he has outlined. We do the cash flow um, analysis for the state of Texas because we pay all the bills. So every year we have to do a cash flow forecast thing to make sure we have enough money in the bank. And that's really just a mismatch in timing between revenue coming in and when it goes out. 
So we usually have a deep hole in December that we have to borrow money for. We haven't had to do that in the last couple of years because of the incredible amount of federal funds and the uh, rainy day fund being so full. We've been able to use those sources to cash flow the budget without having to borrow on the markets. Um, but as part of that function of our office, we meet with the credit rating agencies every year, all four of them. We have a triple A rating with all of them. Um, and we're talking to them about the things that they are rating us on, those long-term obligations. What are the things that we need to be paying attention to in Texas to maintain that triple A credit, credit rating so that when we do borrow money, it's the cheapest money available. And so we take our cues from kind of what they are, the questions they're asking and the things that they're using in their rating formula. And all four of them are different. They all have different ways that they do it. So you try to, you know, split that baby and figure it out. But a lot of it was, um, you know, we advocated for um, long-term obligations being taken care of by the state, and that's our pension systems and those kinds of things. That's what they're dinging states and cities on is their pension obligations being upside down. So we made some changes to the state pension fund. We did some things for TRS to p pump some money into that um, so that those things are not um, upside down or dings on the economy of the state. It's real hard in a two-year budget cycle for the legislature to think long-term. They, they, they are trying to write a two-year budget for the 10th largest economy in the state. So they look at the two-year, what do we need to pay for in the next two years, and they kick the can on those long-term obligations. And that's kind of where Glenn, the role he has played is to say, these are some long-term obligations. If we start paying on them now, it's gonna be less hurt into the future. And so, um, Things like investing in our teachers and our nurses um, are important long-term obligations for the state, and that's what he's going to advocate. But they're going to have to figure out the, the dollar amounts that go towards that, um, and that's where the difficult part comes. So, Okay, do I have time for one more? No. Okay, I think I can do it. I, you had, I, I just, okay, good, I like what, let's end with an easy one. It's going to be filled $24.6 billion will be the full amount. And then it, the cap, cap calculation, that's for 24. For 25, it goes up a little bit to $26 billion and some change, maybe 26.4. But 24, 26. And that, uh, that calculation, it's an if-then. If the, it depends on how much money they spend, and then a 10% of that is, is the cap on the um, rainy, rainy day fund. Um, there is talk, we've, we've spoke with the lieutenant governor about um, removing the cap on the rainy day fund so that that money doesn't flow back into GR. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in, in doing that. So, that, you know, why, why would you cap the amount of money you can save in your savings account? And so, but they, they did that because... They, they wanted to make sure they had a mechanism to flow it back to GR if they needed it. But um, because they can expend out of it, they can dedicate out of it, um, there's, there's some interest in removing the cap. Um, I think politically that would be a, a popular uh, move right now with um, record revenues to say, why wouldn't we spend more of it for what we see as an economic downturn on the horizon? So we're, we're, we've got some really smart people back at the office working on that too, so... In the world, in the world, yeah. yeah. I think we're right behind Canada. We go back and forth with Canada, so, um, but yeah. Bigger than Russia. I can't remember the top 10, but we're, we're number 10. And there's some big guys ahead of us, but um, there's some big guys behind us, so. Okay, I'm out of here. Y'all have a great day. I moved I move that over to the side for my cheat sheet. When we get to our little portion at the end, we will also echo uh, some of the sentiments that Lisa was talking about with workforce training. Um, Gene has been doing a tremendous amount working within our uh, manufacturing industry, and we are also going to be getting into some film and television work um, and some training in that industry coming up with our studio project that's getting ready to uh, come into the community starting hopefully moving dirt this year and being online sometime by next year. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you informed of all of that, but we have a lot of education workforce training um, concepts that we're going to be bringing online by, before the end of this year. So 
Uh, what I'd like to do real quick is give everybody maybe like a two minute break. I think we ran slightly longer than what we anticipated, uh, but great questions, thank you very much. We'll reconvene in just a couple of minutes and we'll talk about uh, Economic Development 101. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little more froggy. Um, all right, if we, can, uh, if we can reconvene, please. Ladies, gentlemen. I feel like I'm herding cats. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And, and I have, my board members aren't even paying attention to me, so I feel like it's a board meeting all over again. Okay. Well, who knew that having a $33 billion uh, budget surplus would be, be such a problem? Uh, wow, it's, uh, it's amazing. I, I'm grateful that I can balance my checkbook at the end of the month. Um, our next speaker is uh, affectionately known as the godfather of economic development uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, and because the industry is getting a little bit younger, a lot of them call him the grandfather of <laughs> economic development in Texas. Um, sorry, I just made that up, Carl. Uh, Carlton has uh, been a good friend to me since I've been here the last five years doing economic development in the state. He has 25 years um, of direct running of the Texas Economic Development Corporation. And if you've not met him through any type of format in economic development, you will now. Uh, absolutely a fountain of information and willing to share it. Uh, he, he knows about almost every little community within our state, and he is more than gracious in talking to anybody about how we can grow those communities. So with all of his knowledge, Carlton Sheets. Good morning, everyone. How y'all doing this morning? Good, good. Um, Lisa reminded me, by the way, didn't the slide say she'd worked at the comptroller for, thir I mean, had worked for the state for 34 years? So they were letting people work at the state when they were in elementary school back then? <laughs> My goodness. Um, I used to work for the comptroller, and um, she was up here doing the unenviable task of trying to tell you all what 181 crazy people were going to do in the Texas legislature, right? Um, anyway, uh, she had a lot of good information. Um, I want to talk to you all today about, um, uh, hopefully when we're done, you'll walk out of here and you'll think differently about economic development. And I'm gonna tell you a little story uh, first. And by the way, I'm gonna be brief, I'm gonna be bold, hopefully, and I'm gonna be out of here, okay? So hang with me, y'all, all right? So when we're coming out of the pandemic, um, I was just chomping to get out, like I'm sure all of y'all were, and I was at a, uh, I was invited to a meeting of the Texas Association of Property Tax Professionals, T-A-P-T-P, -P, Texas Association of Property Tax Professionals. Qu quite an interesting group, big crowd. It was up at the Renaissance Hotel on 183, and I was like so glad to just you know get back out, and it, it, I think it was the summer of 2021, and I, I was still getting off the high of not having to go over to the Capitol during the legislature because it was mostly virtual. So I, they asked me to talk about what economic development is, a little bit of, about what we're going to talk about today. So I, I had these points in the presentation. I, I did this brief um, ED 101, um, which they asked me to do. And, you know, there were folks out there and people were nodding their heads and they were into, you know, what I was saying. Some, of course, were asleep. Um, some, of course, were, you know, looking at their phones and stuff. But anyway, at the end of that, I said, now, 
everyone in the room knows more about economic development than I'd say 95% of the members of the Texas legislature. And when I said that, I looked right at a state senator. <laughs> I was like, hmm. Oh, he laughed, thankfully. Uh, didn't get mad at me. But he's still not for any of the stuff that we do. So, Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Y'all are kind of hard. I'm, 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 I'm going to try to make you laugh. But if we don't get there, we don't get there. Let's get started. I... I, I want I want you all to um, to understand that that econo what economic development is perhaps just as importantly what it isn't as you all support what's going on uh, with the Bastrop EDC and and before I get started um, I want I want to say this for a, a number of years probably the last fifteen years. There's been a lot of turmoil in the economic development arena here in Bastrop, just in, in terms of turnover among staff, uh, among, by the way, I think one of the best and most desirable jobs in our state. And you all have now assembled a team with Angela, Adina, Jean, and Brett that is outstanding and I say that not because I'm in the room with them but because I get to observe what's going on out there around the state and right now we do not have the talent in our world the economic development world that matches the marketplace that meets the needs of the marketplace I can remember we, we'd have job postings on our site and we were like oh my god there's eight jobs available in economic development in the state. You go to our site now, and if there's not 30, you know, it, things are getting better, right? So y'all got a good team in place here. You've got a good vision in place here. Let's celebrate that. Let's, uh, let, let's empower them. Let's entrust them. And uh, let's move forward with economic development here in Bastrop, Texas. A little bit about us. Um, we like to say we were cool uh, in economic development before it was uh, popular. Um, back in the day when we were established, economic development was industrial development. And um, over time, uh, back in those days, we were the TIDC. Um, in 1991, we became the TEDC. And our organization has grown with the emphasis on economic development as it has grown in the state over the years. We're a professional association. We do what um, associations for the various professionals in this room, you, you may be a member of a, an association. Uh, it's about providing uh, professional services to enhance the professional's uh, ability to do their job and do it well. We're going to talk about what economic development is, what do economic development organizations do, and related to that is the history of economic development efforts in Texas. We're going to talk real briefly about what you can do with a type B corporation. You all are a type B corporation. I'm going to explain what that means later on. Dan is going to tell you a lot more about the legal aspects of a type B corporation how they operate, how they should operate, um, and, and again, what that means for what you all can do here. The good news is you can do a lot, okay? And you've already done a lot over the years. Um, they, the, the Economic Development Sales Tax in the legislature, it being a legislative session, um, you know, Lisa's up here trying to um, tell you what might or might not happen. Well, we go over there, um, cross our fingers, tell them what we'd like to happen, and hopefully they don't screw things up, okay? Um, we've been lucky um, in, in, in the last several sessions, so hopefully we can, we can um, maintain that winning streak. Talk a little bit about the economic, um, economic impact of the sales tax corporations and then our legislative pr priorities. You all, by virtue of passing the economic development sales tax, have 
have determined, the people in this community have decided uh, intentionally that you want to do economic development. So economic development is an intentional act, and it includes a broad range of activities to um, implement an economic development program in this community. And we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, when we talk about the history, we're going to talk a little bit about how in, in Texas, economic development is a local endeavor. It's on y'all. The people in this room and the leaders in this room, the board members, the council members, concerned citizens, it's on y'all to determine what happens here. And, and we'll talk about why and uh, why that's important and why that transpired um, and why that's a great thing, um, in our opinion. And it's collaborative. You can't do economic development without it being a team effort. So how does it work? Now, this is where we're going to talk a little bit about the theory and practice of economic development. It starts with primary employers providing primary jobs that bring new dollars from the outside into a community, into a region, into a state, into a country that then is churned through the economy um, multiple times. And, and that is how economic activity, economic churn, and more importantly, the multiplier effect occurs you are on the doorstep of a primary job machine called Austin, Texas. Okay? I mean, it's mind-boggling the economic development that is going on in Austin and has been for ever, right? For at least, generally speaking, at least the last 40 years. And it is a machine of economic activity, and the kinds of jobs that go to that are, that are coming into this region, and I'm in you know, Austin's impact doesn't stop at the Travis Bastrop County line, that's for sure. But the kinds of jobs that produce the churn, that produce economic development, generally speaking, produce that good or service through manufacturing, through professional services, through warehousing distribution, through regional and national headquarters operations. All of these are the, the, the sort of, when, when Brett is, is, is working in economic development, those are the jobs, and those are the kinds of investment that he and the BEDC set their sights on because those jobs have the greatest impact. The non-primary jobs are the result of economic development the grocery stores, the service stations, the restaurants, the dry cleaners. Those are the, the jobs that are a result of economic development, not a driver thereof, okay? So when we talk about primary jobs, we've thrown a few up here. Um, some of those, of course, with Central Texas Connections, Samsung, Tesla, Dell, and, and you know, we could go on and on uh, because our state is – a, an incredible um, primary jobs driving machine at this point in time. I, I, I read a report by Ray Perriman recently. Last year, the, the U.S. created about 1.2 million jobs. 700,000 of those were in Texas. So think about that. I mean, you want to you you try to understand why there's such an incredible population growth in our state, there's the reason. There's jobs here. People come here for jobs. So about 60% of all the new jobs that were created in the United States in 2022 were created in Texas. Some of the primary employers here um, in Bastrop. You know, when I think about Bastrop, I think about back in the day, um, I used to do um, corporate site location. And one of the things, one of the things you have here, I don't know this, the, the statistics on this, but you have a, uh, and, and it was demonstrated to me as I was coming down 71 this morning. 
man, I just cruised here. I live in Southwest Austin, got on 71. I was here in you know, no time. As I was driving outbound to Bastrop, the lines of cars, you know, essentially went all the way back to Bastrop. And so you have a jobs housing mismatch here. You have, you have a lot of people, you've experienced growth, you have, you know, good place to live. You have, you have all of the things in place except for a lot of jobs. The jobs are elsewhere. And one of Brett's and his team's really one of the things they're going to try to do is keep people from having to commute 35 miles. You know, that there's more jobs here that can stay in this community. So it's just, it's, it's not something that, you know, literally hundreds of communities in the United States are facing, but you've got that here uh, for sure. And uh, that's one of the things that, that, of course, they'll be addressing over time. Talked a little bit about that multiplier effect. I don't know if this thing works. Oops. Ah, whew. See if this works. Oh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this slide. <clears throat> it talks about the, the, the generation of local taxes of a 500-employee pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, company that, um, gen that pays, on average, about $67,000 a year. Here are the job creation benefits. Here's the churn. Here's the the multiplier effect. Some, something like this fictitious 500 employee pharmaceutical manufacturing firm creates another 1,900 jobs. And imagine in, in Austin with the tech industry, uh, the multiplier effect is significantly higher than that. It's seven to one, okay? So when you have 2,000 Google employees the average wage of $110,000 a year. You want to understand why Austin is growing. Or Samsung in Northeast Travis County has an average wage of about $115,000 a year. So again, you see the, the multiplier effect of something like that. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. It's breathtaking. And uh, I know I'm geeking out on y'all, aren't I? Uh, uh, anyway, um, it's a way to understand what's happening to us um, in the Central Texas region. So primary jobs are the foundation of economic development. And by the way, they don't care about county lines. So you're, you're being affected by that machine over there west of you. Um, you're getting retail growth from that, obviously. But you know, primary jobs and, and economic development doesn't, doesn't care about county lines or city lines or anything like that but it is nonetheless the foundation of everything that happens after that. Retail is a product of economic development, not a cause of it, we just said that, and local governments benefit from what occurs in economic development. A couple of other things. Transfer payments, um, uh, sin, um, excuse me, Sun City, where happy hour starts at two o'clock every afternoon, um, is an example of um, the power of transfer payments. Everybody at Sun City up there in Georgetown, generally speaking, is from somewhere else, right? Uh, they play golf, they drive around in golf carts, and um, best I can tell, they drink heavily. But nonetheless, that money came, God, man, people generally laugh at that. Yeah, y'all wearing me out. Um, but their money, in the form of social security payments, in form of 403B pro plans, 401K, uh, pensions. That money is coming into Georgetown and is churning through the local economy. I offer this as an example because it's yet another way economic development works, right? Tourism. Tourism, um, I use, my mom just passed away back in the fall, but she ran a bed and breakfast on our ranch. Um, and it was a little cabin. And about 75% of her customers came from Houston. Okay? And so 
they 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 would bring if you think about it they bring their Houston dollars into Kamau County spend it there they spend it at my mom's bed and breakfast um, they'd spend it at Green Hall um, they'd spend it getting drunk and going down the Guadalupe River you know I grew up there we were always happy to see them go back to Houston right uh, but anyway that's economic development because that was money that came from the outside and is churning through the local economy. What we're trying to do is over on the right-hand side of this slide is create this virtuous circle. Brett and his team, along with uh, successful businesses here in Bastrop, are trying to improve this community. And economic developers are really where it begins and ends at bringing all of the groups together that um, are part of this team that I mentioned earlier to do economic development. And here's some examples. I'm trying to be brief. Okay, hang with me. I, I threw this into the presentation today because I remember less than 12 years ago, you all had a devastating fire and fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and heat waves and droughts and you know, just about anything you can think of, <laughs> pandemics, I've got a feeling that it'll be less than 100 years before we have another pandemic, okay? I don't know. I, I believe in science, and that's what I read. But um, economic development corporations are going to have to be more in tune with disasters. And that's kind of the latest um, uh, trend in the economic development world that economic development organizations can pivot to meet the requirements that come out of a disaster. In Houston, there will no doubt be more flooding and a lot of it. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, you can't, you, you can't have 60 inches of rain in one place and there not be a flood, okay? So um, these, are, these are the kinds of things and they're going to happen to us in Texas with our temperature extremes. Uh, you know, we're going to have more fires. We're going to have more droughts. We're going to have more floods. I'm not going to go into all of these factors relating to resiliency and recovery, but I will mention one thing. When the pandemic started, we had a lot of our organizations that didn't know what to do. We wanted the governor to uh, issue a proclamation to allow Brett and his team and the 700 other EDCs to do whatever they needed to do to meet the needs of the local community. We didn't get the resolution, but we said, you do what you need to do. And it was the most heartwarming and positive thing I've seen in all my years at the TDC because our EDCs around the state got together, they threw the rules out the window and said, we got to do something for our businesses. When the federal money started flowing in and there were other ways that we, that our businesses in the state could get relief, they got back and started doing, and they played by the rules and started doing what they were set out to do or what, what their strategic plan says they need to do and, and move forward. So that was an example of EDCs in the state meeting the needs, meeting, being resilient, and aiding in the recovery of, of, an, of the communities that they represent. The best economic development organizations um, implement action plans that are related to a strategic plan, period. Um, and, and this is what, um, this is something that's changed a lot in the last 10, 15 years go into a room like this or at one of our ED sales tax workshops, ask how many communities had a strategic plan and an action plan implementing a strategic plan. And generally speaking, there'd be two or three hands that would be raised. Now you go into that same room and there's 20 hands that are raised. And by the way, a strategic plan, you don't have to pay a consultant. You don't have to pay a lot of money. It doesn't have to be 40 pages long. In fact, the best strategic plans that I've ever worked on or been a part of 
were less than 10 pages long. In fact, when I was a consultant and we were doing this work, I had a really creative boss, and he said, let's, moving forward, let's see how short we can make a strategic plan, where somebody would actually read it, right, instead of it being 200 pages and sitting on a shelf collecting dust. So it's a, it's a doable strategic plan, and it's, and, and it's implemented by yearly action plans. So what do Brent and his team do? They do business retention. They market this area. They do workforce development strategies. They do strategic planning. They help small businesses and entrepreneurs. And why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it mainly the middle checkpoint to control one's destiny. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's on the people in this room about where you go and what you do. We're going to talk... Uh, again, about why that's the case and the way that works in history, in related to our history in Texas as opposed to other states. Okay, um, it's about diversifying your economy. I don't care how good you are in economic development. Right now, in Austin, Texas, there are layoffs occurring. Austin, Texas, that that you know primary jobs monster. There are layoffs occurring. There are companies that are dying today, today in a boom town, because that's the business world. Businesses, you know, are born, they grow, they die, generally speaking, okay? And so it's about diversifying your economy because that's going to happen to you. That's going to happen in your community. And then competing for investment. It's okay to decide, well, we're not going to compete for this one because we can't do it for whatever reason. Most communities want to compete. Most people are at least a little bit competitive, right? Most people, a lot of people are very competitive and they want to compete for these jobs. Those three things are why what you all do here, those are, those are the more, most important reasons for your existence. We talked a little bit about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to move forward in some of these things that that I'm getting off base on. Um, economic development is no longer just about business attraction. It's about where people want to be. The, um, the example I like to use there, if you'll, if you'll uh, indulge me, uh, my middle son uh, was on the eight and a half year college plan. Do y'all, do y'all know anybody like that? Now, he did some pretty cool things. He, he was a fly fishing guide uh, in and around Rocky Mountain National Park. Then he graduated to Yellowstone uh, before, the, you know, before the television series. Um, and, and, you know, so he was working, but he was going to ACC. You know, uh, he, he started off going to college at the College of Charleston. Now... I took him down there. I knew we were in trouble when he was the only guy wearing Wranglers uh, boots and a PFG shirt. You know, he wasn't wearing a, a, a bow tie with one of those little ice cream suits, right? Anyway, um, I'm trying like hell up here. Um, so one time I got frustrated with him and I, I said, come on, man, you got to do something. I mean, you know, going to taking six hours at ACC, isn't cutting it. Well, Dad, you know, I was, I was running a fly fishing lodge. Yeah, I know. And, and, and if I'm running a fly fishing lodge, I'm never coming back. Sorry. Uh, well, you know, I'm trying to. Well, so I got frustrated with him. And I said, look, you've got a good driving record. Why don't you, uh, oil boom, you know, five years ago, why don't you go to Odessa, get a CDL, go to Odessa, and make $110,000 a year driving a truck? I mean, when I told him that, he looked at me like I was completely insane. Because, you know, if somebody had told me that when I was 22 years old, that I could do that and I was struggling to get through college, I'd have been in Odessa like as fast as you could have gotten there, right? Because I, I just, I wanted to go someplace where they'd pay me a lot of money, not him. I mean, good news is, got a really good job in Austin, Texas. He, he loves Austin, probably never leave. But he was not going to go to Odessa, Texas 
to get a well-paying job. He would have rather have, you know, you know, been homeless on the corner of um, Southwest Parkway and Mopac. Um, that's the way his generation thinks. They want to be, they, their place is more important than going somewhere to make a lot of money. Okay. Uh, you all are part of a really great place. This is a really cool little city. And you can see why people want to move here. And you can see why people like this place. You all have place. Austin, from a big city standpoint, has place. You know, the other night I ran into this same cat, my son, at, at the basketball game. He's got three friends with him. I mean, he told me he was going to be there. He came by our seats. And, you know, I, so I always ask, um, I said, well, where are they from? Well, the, one of the young ladies was from Pennsylvania. The other one was from Washington State. And then there was a guy who, who must have understood me. He goes, I'm from Round Rock. <laughs> I about fell over, you know. I'm like, whoa. Uh, but anyway, uh, people are pour young people are pouring in here to work. Um, you, you know, uh, a lot of them leave. You know, for, for my generation, you know, those of us who wanted to, like, have an adventure, we went to... New York or D.C. or Chicago, and I actually went to Chicago and, and, and really enjoyed. My older son is in Chicago right now and, and, and enjoying himself. But that's what Austin has become. Young people who are ambitious want to have good jobs. Some of them stay. Some of them figure out that there's traffic here, you know. Um, we've talked about some of these things already. I'm getting way ahead of myself uh, trying to make y'all laugh. Um, one of the, uh, of the checkpoints here, uh, recruiting and training skill workforce and programs that build on your advantage, not your disadvantage. I think it's important for everybody in this room as leaders of this community to understand, it's just as important for you all to understand what you can't do here as it is what you can do here. Um, and then cooperation. Uh, I've, I've seen too many communities where there's a lack of cooperation. There's a, um, a, a lack of cooperation between the councils and the boards, and, and, and it's just a, it's a mess. If you're interested in what conflict can do to an economic development organization, read the news reports out of San Angelo. They talk about a mess. It is unbelievable. They'll never be able to hire an economic development professional after what's gone on there in the last six months. And it's crazy. It's crazy because the, the, the council is dictating what the ED board is, is doing, yet the council named the ED board. But it's, it's a great study in what not to do. Y'all got to be harmonious, and if you've got that, Y'all are going to do some great things here. Look at number three. You've got, like I said before, you've got a heck of a team here now. Let them run. Let these horses run. Manage them, but let them run. I had mentioned a little bit earlier about knowing what is important and what you can do as opposed to what you can't know the strengths and weaknesses of Bastrop in this regional economy, uh, your place in this regional economy. And, and, your, and your team knows all these things. But it's just as important, I think, that you all know that by working closely with Brett and his team, um, that you know um, why they do the thing, or the board and, and, and Brett's team, why are they are doing the things that they're doing um, and, and it's, it's because they understand the regional economy and they understand the Bastrop economy and they understand what can be done here. So if I was bo to boil all this down, I would say the best EDCs in Texas work best this way. A council that's supportive, naming uh, people to the boards 
that are generally parts of the business community, right? And then they work harmoniously together. And that if there are political issues related to the two, they work themselves out. They get together with each other and they figure that out. Um, if you can achieve that, you're going to have a good run here. Okay, let's talk real quickly uh, about uh, the ED sales tax law. Y'all are a type B corporation, which means you can do primary job economic development. We've talked about that. Um, and then you can do all of these things that are not, that do not require that you create or retain primary jobs. You can do job training. You can do infrastructure. And by the way, this organization dating back the last 25 years has paid for a lot of infrastructure. And we get criticized at the legislature that, well, you know, all these EDCs are sitting on a bunch of money and we're a rapidly growing state. I don't know why I'm talking like this. But anyway. <laughs> it only took me a half an hour. Okay, I'm out. I'm out. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, they, they, they criticize us because, you know, hey, we're a rapidly growing state. We, you know, we need infrastructure dollars. Cities need infrastructure. Well, you know, as I understand it, you all paid for a lot of infrastructure here to support a lot of the retail growth you've had. Out there where um, uh, Home Depot is and, and all, of those, uh, all of that great shopping that you have here. And that was, that was a, probably a good time to do that. Now um, it's time to do something different. It's time to do real economic development. Uh, that, and that, by the way, that's community development. Again, not criticizing it. It was a time to do it. Um, but you can do all those other things that are listed there. Um, there's, there's the things that you can spend your infrastructure uh, dollars on. Uh, infrastructure being infrastructure. Um, I challenge you to do number three, beach remediation along the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> they laughed at that one too. Shit, I'm on a roll, man. <laughs> um, primary job development. The beauty of type B, you can do community development expenditures and you can do primary job expenditures. The rub potentially is the pressure you know, balancing, well, we want to, you know, we, we want to do this as a community development expenditure. We want to do this in bringing, you know, a multiplier effect jobs. That's the key. If you can balance that, man, you've, you've really, really done a good job uh, with your economic development organization. There are a, a number of type Bs in the state that have managed to do that. And I think you all can do it, and you're already doing it. So uh, keep up the good work. Um, type B corporations can also build water supply, um, water supply uh, uh, facilities with a special election, and they can do parks, uh, sport and athletic facilities, tourism and entertainment facilities, other the, if, if you want to, if you're going to learn, can appreciate one thing or learn one thing about type B, it's the last dot point in the corner there. Other improvement or expenditures to promote what, what's not in there, deemed by the board, deemed by the board to promote new or expanded business activity and retain primary jobs. Man, that gives you a broad, broad level of discretion about how you can expend your dollars. And that's, again... In a, in a city uh, like you all are at your, this point in your history, that's a great thing to have. Take advantage of that. You can't fund uh, learning centers, K through 12 educational facilities or municipal buildings, but in the wild, wild west era of the economic development sales tax, it was done. Yeah, it was done, yeah. That, there were a lot of nice libraries built in the early 1990s with economic development sales tax funds. Absolutely. Um, there have been football stadiums built with economic development sales tax funds, uh, and there have been municipal buildings built with economic development sales funds. All of those were illegal. 
Um, so we used to try to embarrass, uh, thanks Gene. Uh, all of, we used to try and embarrass the communities that did that. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna do that anymore, but Pampa built the football stadium, in case you're wondering. Uh, all right, let's talk about the legislature and let's talk about um, where we fit with the legislature. There are 726 economic development corporations like yours. Isn't that amazing? And they bring in about $1.2 billion a year and about $300 plus million a year. This is what we tell the naysayers in the pink building. Um, $300 plus million a year are spent, is spent on infrastructure that those corporations are spending on infrastructure related to economic development projects. That money that's spent on infrastructure needs to be related to an economic development project. And if there's one other thing you can remember about the law, uh, when Dan gets here later, the most important word in the 143 pages of, the, of sections 501 to 505 of the local government code is project. Okay. Um, so we're doing a lot of good out there. We're, we're, we're doing economic development at the local level. We're spending money on infrastructure and our success um, it really is the envy of economic development organizations all over the country. So we, you know, the, the, the Wild Wild West era, 1989 to 2005 of the economic development sales tax, we're through that, of course, uh, but there was a lot of crazy things going on, and the legislature looked at it as a toy. Uh, we've, we've, again, hope it don't jinx myself, but we stopped that from happening. We asked them to leave us alone, and they have for the most part, and now we're doing economic and community development like we were designed to do. Um, and, and we have our tax-funded mechanism to do economic development. All of these other entities do, too, we ask them to stay out of our business and we'll stay out of theirs. If you don't have, uh, and if, you know, every session of the legislature, it hasn't happened to us yet, but somebody will come to our office and say, well, you know, we're over here in Hillsboro and we want to do this. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, uh, adopt an amendment. Our state rep or state senator is going to adopt an amendment that is going to allow to do this in Hillsboro and Hills, Hill County not knowing what that amendment and that law, that, that amendment to local, the local government code would do to literally hundreds of other cities. The point is we're against carve outs. We want the rules to be the same for everyone. And again, we've had some success with that, but we feel like that's really the only way to do it. And if you um, are open-minded and think about how you can do what you want to do because we believe strongly in local control. We can probably help you figure out how ex to expend the dollars that you have uh, or you want to dedicate to a certain project um, in your community. All right, I'm, I'm going to fly now. I'm running out of time. Um, you water down the economic development sales tax law. Who's going to do economic development? Who's going to, who, who, who will have funded that publicly funded industrial park that you have, business park that you have, it wouldn't be there without the economic development sales tax. It would not be there. Who would implement your, uh, your efforts to do um, you know, motion pictures and media here? No one. No one. You have the resources to do it. That, that is, is why you're able to do it is because you have those resources. Without the economic development sales tax, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, real quickly, the economic development sales tax direct monies to create jobs over the last 30 years, about 1.2 million primary jobs. You can imagine the churn related to that. And then 7.1 billion um, per year in economic impact and 4.9 billion per, per year in tax benefits. Here's our, um, our legislative agenda, uh, protecting the economic development sales tax for economic and community development, supporting legislation to, to uh, the next two are about to preserve 
um, very, I'm not going to get into these, very important incentives that Bastrop could be using uh, that, that not only the, the, the school district, the, the county, the city, uh, these items two and three speak directly to local control and they speak directly to what you can do or the incentive programs that you can employ to bring business to Bastrop. And so we're, we'll be over there working to reauthorize um, those important incentive programs to the state uh, and to our communities. Um, the other uh, items four and five are workforce development programs and the Texas Enterprise Fund. Uh, we anticipate that those will be refunded and uh, that will continue to, those, those are important state level programs that support uh, what, what Brett and, and his team are doing here in Bastrop. We're pro-business, we're pro-public investment, and we're pro-local control. Questions? Okay. I needed to get back anyway, right? Uh, yeah. Type 8 corporations were the first um, created by the legislature, and they were traditional primary job economic development that was their focus when the legislature created the economic development sales tax in 1989 let's bring in industry remember the author was bill ratliff state senator from mount pleasant how can how could mount pleasant compete with cities in southwest arkansas southeastern oklahoma western northwestern uh louisiana for investment, they, he felt like they, those places were all getting investment, but Mount Pleasant wasn't. So if you think about it that way, type A, primary job development. Type B, you can do primary job development, you can do community development. It's, it's, and you wonder, why isn't everybody a type B? Uh, there's a lot of communities that don't want, uh, they wanna be narrowly focused, okay? And that's why you, there's still 206 um, type A corporations. Other questions? Thank you all so much for having me. I had a great, uh, great day here in Bastrop, Texas. So how are we doing? Do we need, need another break, or do we want to jump right into um, talking about the, uh, the legal side of everything? Break. break. Okay. We'll give everybody a couple minutes, and then we'll reconvene. Okay. The trickle-down effect. We're starting to lose people. If we could all come back together, please. Even my staff isn't listening to me now. Come on, come on. It, it's like being in the office. My staff doesn't even listen to me, so. Okay. A couple of quick housekeeping items um, from Carlton's uh, performance. It's surprising how much 10 bucks can get him to say my name and uh, thank us for doing what we're doing. But quite honestly, uh, it's a team effort and it isn't me. Um, Gene and Angela have been running this organization for a very long time and I've only been here four months and I walked into something that had every potential in the world to be a great thing and I'm just lucky to be a part of it. So the thanks go to these two ladies over here to continue to move things forward. Uh, so you've heard uh, about the robust uh, opportunities at the state. You've now heard about Economic Development uh, 101, what we can and can't do. And shortly here, we will be talking about what we are doing, uh, if you don't mind sticking around for that. But our next performer, <laughs> Dan Santee, started in stand-up comedy in 1995. I'm sorry, started in, as an attorney in 1995. And uh, he works for the law firm of Denton Navarro. Dan is very well-spoken, very well-versed in economic development law, as well as um, uh, land planning law. So we're very pleased to have him here. Uh, Dan does like to um, point out to everybody that his biggest claim to fame is that he is 
Megan Santee's husband, and um, Megan is our attorney, so we're very grateful for that as well. So, Dan, please. Hello, good morning. It's Friday, so uh, I only have about 10 substantive slides, and they're only substantive because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you they are. We'll, you'll decide whether or not they're substantive. So I was back there nervously listening to Carlton. I remember the first time I heard him. I had just started uh, in economic development. I was like 16, and uh, he is the godfather. But no, seriously, I was concerned he was going to use one of my clients as one of his... <laughs> Uh, you know, one of his examples of what not to do. And I was very, very glad he didn't. But uh, I'm actually pinch hitting for my, my, my law partner, Charlie Zeck, who, who could not do this today. And so uh, I, I don't know that he endorses what I'm going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't share it with him ahead of time. But we'll see. You'll, you'll, you'll find, if you're in Bashup, you'll find out soon enough. Um, but what I'm going to run through is just really the, my approach to this there's no way to tell you all the type B EDC law. I mean, there's just no way to cover all that. I don't have enough time. You don't want to sit here for that. So I'm focusing more on the questions I get asked. I've been doing this over 20 years in economic development uh, with cities. I was in-house city attorney for, for, for a long time, for 18 years with Abilene, and I handled the Development Corporation of Abilene that whole time, which is actually a four. <laughs> yeah. And, and hey, did, did you take it personally when he started using the way we talk in West Texas? I was like, why is he, why is he impersonating me? But, but yeah, I was in Alley, grew up out there, uh, Merkel, Texas, population 2,400 right outside Abilene is where I grew up. And uh, so 18 years in, in the city of Abilene, and we were a 4A. And so when I joined the firm seven years ago, I was like, this is great. We can do all this other stuff with a type B corporation. And so most of my corporations now are type B or actually MDDs, we're not going to do that today. A municipal Development District, those are fun little creatures. Do what? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, different creature, not authorized to talk about those. But we do represent some of those. So I'm going to focus on questions I've been asked by EDC directors. This actually said questions I've been asked by Adrian Pettis, who's my director in shirts. But sadly, Adrian is going to be leaving shirts. I was like, okay, I'm going to take your name off of that then. I'm not going to, I'm not going to out you like that. Um, so Carlton already covered this, so, uh, but, but I'm going to focus on three things just that afford. Th these are the big things because often Type B corporations don't get into a lot of the stuff that they could do that's vastly different. But community facilities, affordable housing, and water facilities. Water facilities may not be an issue here. They may not come up a lot here. But I have other smaller rural Type B entities where that's a big thing, that they're able to do water improvements because so much so often they work on uh, rural uh, rural water uh, rural ag, ag loans and stuff to get their water system and keep it running they're on wells if, one, if a well goes down and you only have one that's a problem and so usually when they authorize their EDCs in those smaller communities they they will make sure that they can do water facilities and water conservation product pro, uh, projects especially over where I do most of my work, uh, where, where they're all coming off of, the, off of wells and springs and such. Affordable housing, I don't see that entertained as much, but community facilities, in, it, just in my experience, are the primary driver for a lot of communities when they want to do type B. Instead of when they choose that over a type A, it's because of the community facilities and their ability to contribute to that. I, I have... Uh, one former client where li literally they, uh, they paid for the Parks Master Plan for, with their Type B, and their annual budget was devoted to trying to develop the best park system, sports complex, everything they could, because they felt like that's what they needed for their community. That's what their community wanted to see. Legal under the community facilities for the Type B. We kept, I tried to encourage it, hey, let's, how about Lee, we create a few jobs or something such? But it was a small community, so they could do that. But those are the those are the primary drivers that I see. Now, how is a 4B different from a 4A? I get that question a lot with with directors who come into a 4B and they've and they're not accustomed to it. So directors are seven specifically. So if you're familiar with a Type A, it, it's at least five, and it doesn't tell you there's not a cap. 
And it doesn't really tell you who they can or cannot be. And so I, I've dealt with some forays where it's actually all members of the governing body sit as the type A. Two-year term, serve at the will of the city council, that's, that's the same, right? as far as the serve at the will of the city council. I've also had some folks misinterpret. If you read in, I, I, I can't remember if it's in 501 or 504 where it talks about um, no longer than six year terms. I've had some folks try to tell me that means that's a term limit. You can only serve three terms. I was like, no, you can't have a term that's longer than six years. But they've taken care of that in type B. It's, it's two year terms, right? And so, but for, for type A's, we've, I've had that discussion before. And for a community that has fewer than 20,000, which you do here, members may be residents of the city, the county where most of the city is located. That's a big deal. I have a lot of cities that are in three counties, actually. Um, or within 10 miles of a resident of a county bordering the county where most of the city is located. So it's a lot more permissive, right, for, for who can serve. And I think that it, here's just my take on why that is. First of all, if, you, if, if, if you're with a community, you know how hard it is to get people to serve, right? It's really, it's, they see you coming a mile away and they're afraid you're going to ask them to, to serve. If you're, on the, if you're on a city council, God bless you because you, that's what you spend a lot of your time doing, recruiting. And it's like being on the committee of, com, of committees at the Baptist church. And you're, you're constantly trying to find folks. Uh, but it's easier in these smaller communities because they're able to get folks from the county when they're a type B and at least three of the seven must not be employees, officers, or members of the city council, the authorized municipality, which y'all can do math, uh, I hope. And so if there's seven and at least three can't be, that means four can. So you can have a majority of a type B corporation be employees or representatives from the city that is the sponsoring entity. And, and many do. So this is a great question I get all the time. Do we have to follow all the city rules? And I'm going to go through this a little bit because, no, you don't. Um, but cities often want you to. And that's, listen, I represent cities. I represent a lot of cities. And the cities, I get this question from both sides. Well, how can we make them do this? Well, can they make us do this? And I'm like, yes, 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 yeah, yeah. It works that way. Because the statutes, the law doesn't say that you have to do some of these things that cities do. But remember that the, the city, as the, as, the, as the overarching entity, can say, look, for every, I have cities that do this. They make policies or they even adopt ordinances that say all the boards and commissions that are appointed by city council are going to comply with the Open Meetings Act, which y'all have to anyway, EDCs do. But like the golf course uh, committee doesn't have to. And telling those guys, I like, guess what y'all get to do now? Y'all got to post, y'all got to post your meetings because the, the council just passed this thing. Uh, so this, the city council and the city has the authority to require you to follow their purchasing requirements. They can have you adopt, have an EDC adopt, you know, ethical guidelines that mirror what a council has to do with regard to conflicts of interest and things like that. Here's the reality, is that a, a type B EDC or any EDC is a nonprofit corporation it's governed by the Texas Nonprofit Corporations Act, as well as the statutes that Carlton talked about and I'm going to talk about. But what they don't have to do, they're, while they're subject to TOMA and TPIA, which is Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Public Information Act, it's not subject to 171, which is conflicts of interest. That is, those are for government officials. Board members of an EDC are not governmental officials by law, right? So they don't have to comply with conflicts of interest. It doesn't mean they don't have to comply with conflicts of interest. It means that their conflict of interest statute is in the, in the Texas Nonprofit Corporations Act. And here, here's kind of how that works. If, if I'm on an EDC, and I've, and I've lived through this many times, and I believe I have a conflict of interest, I declare it to my fellow board members, and they decide whether or not I have a conflict of interest. They decide, yeah, you do. You should step out. Or, nah, we're fine with that. And that might be an overgeneralization, but that's how nonprofit corporations handle conflicts of interest. Now, that doesn't mean that locally, and I, and I apologize, I don't know y'all's situation here in Bastrop. Most of my EDCs, though, they have to have an adopted, they have adopted codes of ethics and a, an adopted conflict of interest provisions that they follow, sometimes dictated by the council, sometimes just because they want to follow what they deem best practices. But understand this. Any violation of something such as that is not a violation of state law if it's something put upon you by a city. It's a violation of a policy. It's a violation of something local. And that's a very different thing. Uh, 
EDCs are not subject to Chapter 252, which is the purchasing statute for anybody who's familiar with. I'm as, here's my problem, as I assumed y'all have the local government code memorized, like myself. So 252 deals with purchasing and all the different types of purchasing. Well, an EDC, again, not being a, unit of gov a local governmental entity except for purposes of the Tort Claims Act, doesn't have to follow those same purchasing guidelines. They have a lot more flexibility to acquire things that they need to do their job and meet their mission that's, that has been given to them by the city. Cities, not so much. Now, often cities will want you to follow that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if the city says, hey, we want you to follow this, then absolutely follow it. And EDCs are not subject to 253 and 272, which has to do with the sale or lease of property. And that's an important thing, and, and I run into this one a lot, because here's how that comes into play. Um, EDCs, um, in my experience, again, and I do not deal directly with Bastrop a whole lot, except when I get to come over here and pinch hit, but my EDCs, they love buying property. I mean, they love buying property. It's like they, they watch HGTV and decide, oh my gosh, we, we, we can do that. We've got money. We, we've got, you know, $15 million. Let's go buy something. And that's great. And you can, and EDCs can buy property speculatively all day long, and they can market that. They can, they can prepare it, and they can package it, make it shovel ready. And, and it's their project. They put their money into it. They can hold on to it for prospects and make it part of a deal, right? Because if an, it, here's why an EDC doesn't have to do that. If I own property and I'm trying to get somebody in here to put in a manufacturing facility, uh, that's, a, that's a great thing that I can bring to the table, right? And I say, well, I, I'll give you this piece of property. Look, I've, I've already put utilities and everything on it. You can have it. Here's what I want you to do for me, and this is how long you have to do it. And if you don't, then I'm going to claw back that property or whatever else. I mean, but that's a, that's a tool in your toolkit if you're an EDC. If I had to go through posting and, and I had to do bids and I had to do all these things to sell my property, that would not be very conducive to creating jobs or getting deals done. So EDCs don't have to comply with either 253 or 272. Now, the caveat to that is while I don't have to comply with those, let's say it doesn't work out. Let's say I bought a bunch of property as an EDC and the development went the other direction. It's on the other side of town and now I've got this and the only people calling me are RV parks, nothing against RV parks. I love RVs. But, I mean, I, I, it's not manufacturing, right? Or, or, the, or the city changes their comprehensive plan, and now it's not industrial. I'm like, why did y'all do that? Uh, and I've got this land. Well, I have to get fair market value for that if it's not part of a project. If I have land that I'm not going to put into a project, I can't sell it for less than fair market value. Now, you're not going to find that in a statute. That's an AG opinion. I apologize. I didn't. I didn't put the side of it because I've just I've got it pounded in my head. But there's an AG opinion that says, hey, if I'm going to sell property, I have to get fair market value for it if I'm not tying it into a project that's going to be something that's eligible for me to do as an EDC. Doesn't mean I have to necessarily follow 253 or 272, but those are 272 is a good model for how you would get fair market value. Um, and just the uh, last bullet is simply what I said already. A city can certainly... Um, persuade, ask, <laughs> encourage an EDC to follow what the city wants you to follow. And we're going to get a little bit more into how that relationship works. The next question I love is, can the city spend my money? Well, they usually say my. I changed it to EDC money. But, but my EDC boards, they love, they, why can they do that? How can they tell us what to do with our money? The answer is no. And like I said, that is a legal term. I made it up Wednesday while I was driving, and it's accurate, and it means that you have to get along. That's the thing, is that I have this, I have, it's great, because we're in this wonderful position as legal counsel that there are a handful of cities where I represent the city and I don't represent the EDC. There's another handful where I represent the EDC and not the city, and then there's a handful where I represent both. I love those cities, but it's, it's every, it's all over the board. And so I'll call Jeff. I don't know if anybody's ever dealing with Jeff Moore. Jeff Moore and I have been in this business about the same length of time. He, he, we go back to his days in the AG's office. And I, one of the things I often think about is what would Jeff do? Because he's far more conservative and doesn't like the gray as much as I do. But we collaborate all the time, and he represents some of the EDCs where I'm the city attorney. And we pick up the phone and talk about it. We'll bounce things back and forth. And, and often this is the issue is our 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 
two clients aren't playing together in the sandbox appropriately, and we're going to lose a deal, and I, we both need them to get along. And so that's what this is all about is a city can't tell you, and a city can't, I absolutely can't spend the EDC's money, although there is one little thing that I'd have to put an asterisk, and it's not in the slideshow, but when an EDC goes away, right, all the assets of an EDC, whether it's an A or a B, go to the city. We don't have to get into all that, but, but you know, ultimately that can happen with any EDC. I've transitioned three different EDCs, and by that I mean I've either changed them from an A to a B or from an A to an MDD. And we have to have that conversation in those scenarios because while it's not actually going away, it is going away because I'm dissolving this corporation, but I want all the money and assets to make it over to this other entity. And so we have to go to the city and say, hey, we got this great idea. You're going to get all this money and all these assets, but we really want you to move that over to this other corporation or this other entity so we can keep doing economic development. We really need your co cooperation. And that's why this is so important. Cities and EDCs have to get along because at the end of the day, it's taxpayers' money, right? It's taxpayers' money, and we're trying to take it and multiply it and make it into great things for our community and bring jobs here. Uh, but, Yos, you, know, so you learned a new word today. And here's some of the details on that, right? So these are just some AG opinions and some case law that, that kind of uh, amplifies that idea. The way it works in, is that the city council of every city that I ha where I have an EDC, that council has to approve every program and expenditure of my client, every program and expenditure. What form that takes on is the local control that Carlton talked about, right? I, I, I had one city that was like, uh, unless it's over, oh, I don't know, five million, we don't need to see it. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of leeway there, right? They would approve an annual budget with project and I, I don't recommend, uh, listen, first of all, I don't recommend this, that had, uh, you know, project, um, a fund for projects, you know, qualifying projects and then all this other stuff. They approved the budget. They had programs like small business incentives and, and you know, the, the incentive guidelines of the EDC that said if you bring this much money to the table, we're going to incentivize you at this part. And that council was fine. Ah, we approved we approved all your programs. We approved your budget. We've approved your programs and expenditures. Go forth and make jobs, right? Most cities, it doesn't work that way. Most cities, uh, it's a little bit more uh, it's, it's granular as to what oversight they want to exercise. That's the norm in my experience. They want to see definitely programs, right? You can create as an EDC, most of mine, they'll, they'll have a, a menu of programs that they've created, how they'll fund things. They'll have community, community facilities program and all the criteria. They'll have small business and all the criteria. They'll have job creators, market, you know, and then they'll have a marketing budget. And even though the city approves that, they'll establish that dollar value. Any project over a certain amount individually needs to come to the city. And the, and the reason for that is because the way the statute's written talks about them approving projects, and we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. The other, um, the other part of this, though, is the second part of that. The act does not authorize the city's governing body to spend the development corporation sales and use taxes. So while they can approve programs and expenditures, they cannot say, no city can say to the EDC, you are going to budget this money to spend on this thing. And if you don't, we're just going to approve it. And, I've, and I've, I have lived through attempts to do that and tried to bring that back from the edge and explain that's not how this works, right? And you get this, the only thing that comes up is nothing good. The only thing that comes from it is an impasse, right? We want to do this, and the city council saying no. And the city council saying, we're going to replace everybody on the board. You know, we're going to, you know, this back and forth, and it's, it's not conducive to economic development. And, you know, that doesn't, I, I, I'm assuming that doesn't go on here. I've had it go on, though. I've had to deal with it. And, it. and it doesn't benefit that community when those kind of impasses happen. Strategic planning is so critical because of that, having your EDC and your city, you know, together planning what they want to see happen, what they want to do within the confines of the statutes and, and, and reaching some types of working relationship in that, fact, in that way. Um, the next case law is just talking about how there's a, there's, a, there's a duty and responsibility 
for the city that created an economic development corporation to exercise oversight. And that is that local control. What does it look like when we say we need to approve uh, programs and expenditures and what projects need to come forward? Uh, the statute's gonna tell us for a city this size when those projects come forward for approval. Uh, in addition to just programs and expenditures, the budget every year is approved by the overseeing city, as well as any changes to the bylaws. Um, I, had, I had a situation where uh, an EDC went out, they hired a new director, at a, at, at, and again, the salary exceeded that of the city manager in the city. That was not well received, and it never was approved. It didn't come forward, and so there was this argument over we have to prove every program and experience. Well, you approved our budget. Obviously, it had a salary in it for a director. But the city was like, yeah, but we didn't know you were going to spend that much. You know, we didn't know you were going to hire that person. And we didn't know you were going to give them that length of a contract. And, but that's really not what was set up ahead of time, right? That's not the kind of oversight they had said they wanted to exercise. <clears throat> the bylaws uh, of the corporation have to be consistent with state law and the certificate of formation of the corporation. So anytime those bylaws come forward, um, even if I'm not the EDC attorney, in places where I'm the city attorney, when I get requested changes to the bylaws, I always, and, I, and Jeff has amended the bylaws of, of this other client several times, I have their articles of formation, and I, and I have to check what they're wanting to change against their articles of formation. I also look at their strategic plan that's on file or been adopted, you know, what has the city put in place that says this is what we're going to do? What do they agreed on? It doesn't mean that their bylaws don't get approved, but when, when that goes to my client, I want to be able to explain to my client why they are asking for the changes they're asking for, why they, they, it's, in, it's consistent with their articles of formation and the mission that's been given them by the city. And so that's why they do have to approve those. So these are kind of the specifics with regard to, uh, this is under 505158. So 505158 for a type B corporation governs type B corporations in municipalities that are fewer than 20,000 people. So if you're, if it's a small community provision. And, um, you know, the way I read the, the act and the, and the statutes may be a little bit different than Carlton, I feel like that there is still really a lot of broad flexibility for EDCs in smaller communities. Otherwise, this, the, 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 the legislature would not have set them apart on what constitutes a project for them. And the, the trade-off, in my opinion, was specifics on the oversight, right? specifics on the approval. Um, so a type B corporation cannot undertake a project authorized uh, for an expenditure over 10000 until the governing body of the municipality has adopted a resolution and, and, and it had two separate readings on that. Um, so that's your, that's your benchmark, right? So if you're going to exceed 10000 that council is going to see every single project that exceeds $10,000 uh, in a small community. Now, um, the other thing is that the, the, what, what constitutes an expenditure and program can take on a, a lot of different things. And to me, that's, that's a budgetary item. But for projects, under the statute, two readings, separate readings, if it's over 10000 Under 10000 those should fall into a program that's already been authorized, right? So how I normally see those is that if you have a facade grant for down, I have a city that has a Main Street program. And so we partner with the Main Street program with the EDC so that they can create, uh, they can grant small businesses um, facade improvement grants or uh, parking's always a problem in downtown areas. So some parking offsets or things such as that, credits, parking credits. Those are the kind of things that are almost always under $10,000 individually. And so what you'll see in those types of situations is we'll take a program forward to the city council to approve $200,000 for this program with each expenditure capped at a certain amount, right? So the council knows ahead of time, look, we're not going to see who gets these. We're approving a program and an expenditure and this type of general project so long as it doesn't exceed a certain amount. If it exceeds that amount, it comes to us because it'll be over 10000 So that's what I mean by there's other ways to handle some of these things. 
So here are some um, frequent topics, and, and it's hard. there's a lot. I boiled it down to some of my favorites uh, because they, they seem to surface quite a bit. Um, that's a lot to read. You don't have to read it. The reason why this comes up a lot, it's about prevailing wage law. And I'm, I know you all know what I'm talking about because when I read prevailing wage law, I'm sure all y'all do the same thing. You're like, okay, here's what I see. I know. That's what I do. Um, but for those who want to just know the, the synopsis of this, here's how this comes into play for me. I'll have a city and an EDC where I represent both. And, and how that conversation often goes is, wow, EDC, it sure would be great if we could uh, get, this, uh, get this road extension and water and sewer line extended over to this other area. And the EDC would be like, yeah, that would be great if y'all would do that, right? And so there's this back and forth. Uh, that'd be awesome for us, too. Um, <laughs> But when, when I represent both of them, I'm like, okay, so how does this make sense for either one of you? You know, is this in your, is this in your CIP? Is it not? Who's going to handle the project? Is it connected to an actual project that we have? Or is this something we're doing to unlock land, right? That's a great phrase. Listen, I sit on both sides of it, and I use that very, yeah, we need to unlock land, EDC, so we can have development. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. But what often happens is this back and forth as to who does the project. Is this an EDC project? Is it a city project? And the reason why that changes things and can change things is EDCs aren't subject to the, the prevailing wage laws, all right? So when I'm advising my EDC, my first question is the same thing. Hey, do, who, who are we working with on this? Are we gonna be reimbursing a developer who's doing all this stuff? I spent hours on the phone yesterday for that kind of thing. We're coming up with a way that I could get a developer to extend uh, over a mile of wastewater line and water lines to a site that they're developing without the city having to do any of it, uh, as long as the EDC was gonna backstop that, right? As long as the EDC was, as part of the project, gonna reimburse for that infrastructure for that project. And the city was fine with that. Now, the city's role in all of this is simply gonna be to sit back, make sure it, if it doesn't happen, because I'm going to go to the, the city and say, I need, you, I need you to help me out with some eminent domain here because we have a landowner that figured out what we're doing and they won't sell us an easement to run that, run that water line through. The benefit to the city of all that is they're not bidding that project. They're not dealing with prevailing wage law with contractors. They're not doing any of that. And actually, in my situation that I'm trying to pull off, the EDC is not going to do it either. The developer is going to do it. And I'm just going to pay if they get it done. If they don't get it done, man. That's tough that your project's not going forward, but that would have been great if you could have done that. I'd have reimbursed you for all your time and money. Um, it does make a difference, though. The, what the prevailing wage law says, if, I, if I'm doing that on behalf of, I have to use it. But that means they would be a party to the construction contract. So often, from my perspective, when I'm wearing my EDC hat, I don't want this for the city's own good and for the project's good. I don't want the city to be a party on that contract if they don't have to be. Let me run with it, city. Let me take this infrastructure project and run with it. I can do it faster, I can do it more efficient, and I can do it with less red tape. And that's not trying to skirt the law, that is what the law actually allows me to do. And sometimes it makes sense, in it, but it doesn't always make sense. But I get that a lot, so I wanna throw it out there because it goes beyond just prevailing wage. It goes into what we talked about earlier with having to bid projects, how you do that, and things such as that. Okay, this is my favorite by a long way. So I have my EDCs ask me all the time, um, hey, can I do this? And they'll tell me whatever it is. I'm like, I don't know. Is it a hippo? You know, they'll say, can I spend my marketing dollars to do this, this, or this? Maybe. Is it a hippo? Because, I mean, that's the gold standard, right? If, if it's anything less than a hippo, sure, you can do it because they did it. Um, and, you know, and I have these same kind of conversations about hot funds, too. And, you know, does it put heads in bed? Ah, that's not the only thing. Um, but here's what happened was, uh, this is genius, but they decided that to market, I mean, I wouldn't have known Hutto had anything to do with hippos, and, but for this that happened early in my career, you know. Now I know. But they wanted to use that, and they wanted to use their promotional marketing money to put a hippo out there. That's just genius, right? Everybody talked about it first. Like, no publicity is bad publicity. Now everybody knows. 
But what the what was in, interesting is that the, the 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 AG they don't do fact questions. And so anytime you see an AG opinion that says this is a fact question, that means you don't have to read the rest of it because they're not going to actually say anything. They're just going to be like, blah, 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 blah. it's up to the board of directors, right? And so that's what they did in this instance. They said, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they laughed, but they also said, you know, it's a question of fact for the board of directors to resolve in the first instance, subject to judicial review and the supervisory authority of the Hutto City Council. So that means, right, to program and expenditure, so the city council has to approve it as well. And who doesn't want to hit? I mean, honestly, those city council members are like, oh, God, we have to approve it. It's a hippo. Um, um, and then someone could challenge it in court. But the standard when they do is abuse of discretion. I mean, the, because that board of directors for that EDC made the findings. You know, I don't know how many of you, I have no idea who I'm talking to. That's a great thing, right? I have no idea who's out here. I don't know how many of you are on a city council, how many of you are on EDC, how many of you are family members of Brett, you know, right? That he just conned into coming up here and told you, I'll have you a weekend in Bastrop. But those whereas clauses in your resolutions, if you're on council or EDC, those are gold. Your attorney, those are what, they're, they're also known as CYA clauses, right? So that is where your attorney has gone through and written your legislative findings, even if you never thought they read your mind, that this is what you were thinking when you approved this. You were thinking that as an economic development corporation, I have the authority to spend my marketing money as we deem necessary to expand future business opportunities or whatever. Of course you did. So we put that in there. We put all those in there, and then we get to that now therefore, which is like the uh, proclamation, that's why it's legal. Because of all these things that I'm allowed to do and I had thought about and I based my decision on, I'm doing this. You know, da 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 da, hippo. <laughs> and, and so I had one of my, my directors call me. He's like, hey, New Braunfels has a really cool sign when you come into the city. I was like, I know I live there. Um, it's our bridge that's over the river. <laughs> come out. Well, we want a sign too. I was like, okay, great. The EDC wants to pay for it. Perfect. Is it going to be a hippo? No, it's going to be something different, but we don't know what. But can we spend money? I was like, I don't know if you can spend money on it. What does your board think? I'll help them make findings if they want to. If they think it's going to expand business, the current and future business development and all these things, sure, I bet we can do that. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. Um, and then this last little piece, this last little nugget, the AG didn't have to give us anything more, Right? They didn't have to, but they did. They gave us another beautiful little nugget. In addition, unexpended revenues specifically set aside for promotional purposes in past years may be expended for such purposes. What? We, is that my, am I out of time? Is that what I mean? I'm sorry. It's, it's full. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can roll it forward, baby. You can encumber that money and get... And it's, it's, I'm always surprised how many EDCs that I, when, when we get on new client, they don't do that or they don't know that. Or the city told them, no, if you don't spend that at the end of the year, it's ours. <laughs> you know, or something. I'm just kidding. Cities would never do that. But you can, roll, you can roll it forward. If you don't spend all your marketing money. And so that particular city is like, well, we're going to save up our marketing money for a sign that's better than New Braunfels. I'm like, yeah, great. There you go. You save that money up. And uh, so, anyway, it's great. If you don't spend your 10%, 10 every year, you can set that aside, carry it forward, spend it in the next year. And I'll tell you how this became a big, big deal is during the, uh, what, what we will call the lockdown. During the lockdown, a lot of cities were, a lot of EDCs and stuff were scrambling like, how can we help? We have all this money over here, but there's no jobs to create right now. What can we possibly do? And we got really, really creative with, with, uh, with some marketing programs, with some small business innovations to help uh, folks uh, that we you know, often wouldn't benefit from EDCs in larger communities. But particularly in smaller communities, EDCs really, really saved the day for so many of my rural clients by stepping up and saying, you don't have a drive through Well, let's fix that. We're going to make a drive through for you. You know, you don't have outdoor seating. We're going to help you fund that outdoor outdoor seating. And, and I'm not going to give away all my secrets, but we were creative. I'll just put it that way on how they could help with those things. But um, it, it, was, uh, it was really good for them. 
Um, this one I get weekly. Um, I'll get a call from an EDC director saying, hey, the city wants to uh, update their comprehensive plan and they want us to pay for it. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's a great deal for the city. Um, so you can pay for it, but it needs to make sense, right? Not the, the, the city's entire comprehensive plan and, and the entire city doesn't, isn't geared towards creation and expanding job opportunities and community facilities or anything like that. But parts of it might be, right? Like I said before, I had, a, I had an EDC fund a parks plan, you know, parks, the parks portion of a master plan because that's where they wanted to put their money in. So be it. If their board of directors says, we want to fund this part of the comprehensive plan, usually what I see is, is, is EDC stepping up and funding portions that are directly tied to what they're trying to do in job creation, whether it's little pieces of the infrastructure, the, the future, future land use, water, sewer, transportation plans, um, and things such as that. Even, even in some instances, updates to impact fees. Um, and, and the reason for that would be uh, because the, the EDC has a vested interest in how much you're gonna be docking potential manufacturers and stuff on impact fees, right? They wanna know that those studies are done correctly, that the sectors are identified correctly, and they also, if they're crafty enough, are going to be seeing how they can get those credits, right? So for my ADCs, if we're doing an infrastructure project where there's impact fees and we're doing it on behalf of one of our clients that's coming into there, the EDC is not letting the client have those credits. They don't need those credits. We want the credits. You know, and, and how that works is if I get those those credits in every in, that the city has for making on-system improvements, right? That means this is a little side trail, bunny trail, just for y'all. This is this is a, this is a freebie, right? So this bunny trail is that like so I've got this person coming in that's going to locate in an area where they're going to have to build infrastructure, and that infrastructure is shown on the future thoroughfare plan or anything such as that. That's considered an on-system improvement. Right, and so that manufacturer, when they build that, they get credits towards any impact fees that an end user would pay. Because impact fees, more than you need to know, triggered by the type of use coming in. Right, so how many vehicular trips, how much strain on the water and sewer is this type of use going to make? Right, and so the reason why the EDC would want those credits is that I'm going to help that developer who's putting in this huge spec building fill that building because whoever goes in there isn't gonna have to pay those impact fees. I'm gonna put them in my deal that I'm gonna make with them, not that the developer is gonna just take and, 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 and use themselves on some other project somewhere else in my community. I want the EDC to have those credits, and then I'm gonna use them, I'm gonna multiply those credits by using them in my next deal to fill that building or some other building. It just has to be in that sector, right? It doesn't, it, that can't be anywhere, it's gotta be in that sector. Um, so the other thing, I think that's my last slide, actually. Oh, no, it's not. Entertainment projects. Oh, this is a fun one. This, I can't believe they didn't like this. They wanted to do a private radio station's building renovations. But the thing about it is, uh, again, the legislature granted the board of directors of an economic development corporation broad discretion in determining whether a specific project is required or suitable for use for entertainment. And it is the, for the board to decide in the first instance. Um, That category, it's in 505-152. I know y'all are memorizing this as we go. And it gives a laundry list. And, and my colleagues and I used to go back and forth over, well, does that mean it has to be amateur or professional sports or children's sports? Does it have to be that? Man, when you read that, it's just a laundry list that gets longer and longer every legislative session. And it can be any of those things or it can be any infrastructure or anything tied back to those things. That's what's in 505152 under the community facilities and how people do parks. But this might have been a bridge too far. I don't know how this actually turned out, if it was ever litigated or finally approved, but they wanted to do a, a private radio station. Um, you know, they don't think it does. They're like, eh, this doesn't, this doesn't really fit. Uh, but what would, right? And so in the uh, other place in the opinion, it went through, hey, but this would work and this would work and this would work. And so... How I like to look at that and how often my clients approach it, and full disclaimer, I have a couple of EDCs that are, you know, 40,000 or so population. 
Most of them are smaller, and, and the majority of the EDCs that I work with directly are, are fall under the 505-158, so, you know, which is a great, that great statute that lets them do anything that is considered a project, right? Um, so they do a lot in the 152 because they don't have the budget, right? They can't do all the community facilities that they would like to do. They can't provide all the park enhancements they would like to do. And so those EDCs look for ways to partner with the city to do that, to make that work. How does that work? The thought being, and I, 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 Carlton's right, it's all about being a multiplier, but multipliers always aren't about job creation on the absolute front end. Sometimes multipliers are about being a destination community that folks want to live in where you have enough amenities that, that people want to live there, right? And, and, and sometimes it's, it, it's this cart and the horse thing. And smaller EDCs don't always have the same luxury that, that they have when they're a bedroom community around San Antonio where I do all of my work. I'm, I'm, I, my office is in San Antonio. The further away you get from that commute, the harder it is to, to bring the jobs that you would like to have out there um, because people want to live there, but they don't want to necessarily work there. They're going to drive it. I'm just as bad. I live in New Braunfels and I drive into San Antonio. Um, and so those EDCs look for ways to complement that quality of life, understanding that eventually, and I'm starting to see it. Uh, I, you know, I'm starting to see it in some of my smaller communities where they started out spending their money on that. Well, now that people decide they want to live there during the pandemic, they decided, I want to work here too. I can work from home. And then they decide, well, working from home has been great, but now I can't stand my dog or children. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build an office out here, you know? And then they're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill that office and I'm just going to have a little piece of it. And so sometimes it does follow. And in a smaller community, they can look for ways to make that work and, and they get to invest twice. They invest in those community facilities and they find themselves being able to also then come back later and help people who have bought into that expand their business and bring more business. And I'm, I'm particularly seeing this in... And uh, uh, my oldest is 20, 23, and thinks about the world very differently and isn't interested in big cities, isn't interested and loves to be outdoors. He's getting his master's at A&M. But for him, ideal, <laughs> I'm a Baylor Bear, but I, I accept your whoop, whoever did that. Uh, but but he, that would be, for him, that would be amazing. If he could go live in a smaller community but have his office and work there, uh, that would be the best of both worlds for him. And so there's so many opportunities out there if people, if EDC is just, you know, you know, you can have more than one program, right? That's what I, I love to tell them when they say, they act like we're, they're having to decide between bringing in a 300 job uh, company manufacturing versus, you know, enhancing the, the trail system uh, behind, you know, where a lot of your companies are. Believe me, hey, if you, if you enhance a trail system, near your industrial park or whatever, or your business park, today's folks often are gonna wanna be there because they can work there, they can go out to the trail, or they, I mean, there's just, there's this holistic approach that can be done with economic development. 505-152 to me is kind of the key to that. It's the key to unlocking that. All right, so um, these are some final takeaways specific to Bastrop. In, in, only in my opinion, that's my disclaimer, uh, uh, not in Megan or Charlie's opinion, not in Carlton Schwab's opinion, but infrastructure itself can be the project. And I don't, he said infrastructure has to be tied to jobs. I know Charlie feels, you know, infrastructure always has to be tied to jobs. That's just not what the statute says. And I'm just going by what the statute says. It says if you're in a, pop, with a municipality population less to 20,000, project, that definition, whatever you're going to call a project, includes these other things. It includes land, buildings, equipment, facilities, expenditures, whatever those are, uh, targeted infrastructure and improvements. Again, where that board nails those whereas clauses and finds that it promotes new or expanded business development. That's what it includes. Um, and the reason why I know it doesn't have to create jobs when it's that is because the statute also tells us that, because why would you have this next one if it didn't, if it had to? It says, when a project does not create jobs, well, then I don't have to create jobs for it to be a project. It requires a public hearing at the EDC level, right? So your EDC has to have a public hearing. And remember, if that project that doesn't include jobs exceeds 10,000, you gotta have two readings of a resolution at the city council. 
If the project was not authorized by the original election, there's a 60-day waiting period before it can be funded. Um, and it has to be published. And during that time, people can get together a petition and make you have an election on the project. I've had EDCs before who, who do a 60-day wait on everything. And in, in, in reality, the way I read this, and I think a lot, of, a lot of folks read this, is that if it's already been authorized in the original election that created the EDC, if you went that route and had an election, you don't have to do it again. You don't have to have that waiting period because it's already authorized. What if it doesn't get authorized this time? I mean, what if you take a project that was in your original authorization and then this time you get a p That's my timer. That's your oh, that, that right there. I'm sorry. I'd finished telling you how that story ends, but I, I'm out of time. No, so I, this, this comes up for, for me. This does come up for me a lot, and that's, what, that's the question I ask them. When they call and say, hey, can we do this? Do we have to wait 60 days? Um, I, I'm like, i got to see your original ballot language. And that's always fun because I know what they're going to have to do when they hang up the phone. And I'm like, this is going to be good. Let me see how long it takes them. Let's see how kind of city secretary they have, you know, because they got to go find that ballot language. It's a test for my city secretary friends. And they'll come back and they'll say, hey, you know what? Look what it said. I'm like, well, then you're good. Because it'll, you know, the last one I did that one was on was they had a catastrophic failure of, a, of the wastewater. And that's not the one you want. That is, when they say, is going down well it was going down and it was going down the streets it was going there was a catastrophic failure of the wastewater system and and i'm like can we think we don't have any money it was it was sad it was a sad story you know because this city's like we don't have any money what do we do i was like well um does your edc have money yes but we don't think they can we got to wait 60 days I don't know. okay hold on a second let's get the ballot if your edc is interested in helping Let's get the ballot and let's see what it says. And what do you know? It said wastewater and water improvements on the ballot. Now, should it have been on there? I don't know, but it was on there. So we're not going to wait 60 days. We're going to get that fixed, right? We're going to go, let's get that money. Let's get it approved. Let's run this through and let's, let's get that, that stopped. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my parting thing is just look. Yes, it says there's a 60-day waiting period. Yes, it says during that time a petition can be brought forward. But really... Uh, EDCs always need to check that ballot language because sometimes it's like broad. Now, I don't like it when it says, well, everything that's legal we can do. I don't like those. I like it when it specifies the types of projects. I think it needs to specify the types of projects. But as long as it checks those boxes, community facilities, park improvements, wastewater, what, then you're good. Uh, unless the statute specifically, there's some in there that are, are too specific and that would require it, but we're not going to go into that. And that is the end of my comments um and i make no apologies for my liverpool crest <laughs> love my boys in red and uh anyway but questions if you have any questions while you you absorb and enjoy the liver bird uh on the last slide <laughs> perfect thank you That was your opportunity to get free legal, legal advice. I mean, he asked if you had any questions. Um, so we've gone through, obviously, what's happening at the state level. We've gone through the economic development law and the economic development outlook. And now we're going to get to the fun stuff. So let's talk about the Bastrop Economic Development Corporation and what we've been doing. Uh, because part of what we haven't been doing is really truly telling our story. Economic development, as you've heard, is really, it's about tomorrow. Right? It's about these two boys right here, which is Rocky and Don Sergio. Don't ask me which one is which, but they are my boys. And this is why I do what I do. I, I think it's just the opposite, actually, but this is why I do what I do, because I'm thinking of their future. Just like we do what we do as an EDC, because we're thinking about your future. And when I say your future, I do mean down to the level of your business as well as our community. But we can't do it alone, as I mentioned at the outset of this. We have to have all of the parties responsible for our city in the room, which means we do talk with the city. We do talk with the school district. We do work with the county. But what we've lost in the last couple of years because we haven't had the manpower is to really get down and talk with you guys as business people. 
<clears throat> that's going to be changing soon because we are going to be hiring somebody who's going to be coming on board to help us out with that. The secondary part of what we've been doing, as you've heard, is we have a lot of people that are leaving our city to go to jobs uh, up in the Austin market. So we are working hard to attract the positions to come back here um, into Bastrop. Out of that, we've had some pretty good success over the last couple of years. And again, I'm not taking credit for this. This goes to Gene and to Angela, who've really been running this show and doing a very good job of bringing in these opportunities into our business park, some of which have been announced, some of which haven't, uh, and some of which actually will be hopefully moving dirt this year. So that'll give us some excitement to it. But we've had a financial tech company, a fintech company, that has bought some property out here. They're going to be, they will be moving dirt this year and building their facility. And it's good for us because it's opening up a new market. It isn't your traditional type of manufacturing operation. Um, and their client is in the defense industry. Um, so it's, it's, it's offering us, the city, a new opportunity to get into a new crowd so to speak, of jobs and of people that are starting to look at our community. Um, outside of that, we also have, oddly enough, another client that works in the DOED industry that is going to be manufacturing parts that go into drones that are sold off into the DOD. And so again, another exciting opportunity for us. Uh, they are hopefully going to be getting their plans finalized with us before the end of this year, and then there's a possibility that they'll be moving dirt before the end of this year. <coughs> Excuse me. On our periphery, as you know, well, let me finish up with our business park. Our board has uh, given us permission to go ahead and finish up with the engineering and the work for the infrastructure for phase two of the business park. And once we get that completed, hopefully by the end of this year, that's going to open up about another 72 acres for us to get out and market. As you guys can appreciate, it's hard to market something when you can't actually take somebody to it. So when we get the infrastructure in place, and the road is in place and it truly is shovel-ready dirt for somebody, it's going to be a lot easier for us to be able to, to, to bring people here and say, here you go. You know, uh, The city's doing a very good job right now of reworking a lot of the commercial codes and their processes, so it is going to be easier for commercial opportunities to come in and buy and build. So we're looking forward to that. On the periphery of our city, you're probably very well aware of the Boring Company. Um, what you're probably not aware of is that they consolidated all of their operations here into Bastrop. Now, when I say Bastrop, it is Bastrop County. It is just outside of our city limits. But the city is working with them on how we can serve them uh, and serve them what might be in a utility fashion. So that does give us this opportunity to bring Boring Company into our fold, so to speak. Across the street from them, they're opening Starlink uh, Manufacturing Facility. Uh, the building is up, but it still is a long way from being completed. It's 500 plus thousand square feet of space. They will be doing some um, manufacturing for their satellites that they're putting up in space, and they'll probably have a call center. Um, out of these two organizations, we're looking at 600 to 700 jobs that will be coming right here to our city or six miles there from. <laughs> The movie studio project, which you're going to hear a little bit more. Gene's going to talk about some of the training that we're going to be doing for that. Um, we're really doing everything we can to help that project move forward. The public relations out of being able to bring a movie studio here to our city. And we are a film-friendly community, as we are a music-friendly community. But being able to have an actual movie studio here doing productions on a daily basis is fantastic for us. I, I will kind of equate it to hotel occupancy tax, right? You will see productions come here. You will see people here for 60, 90, 120 days while they're shooting a project, staying in our hotels, eating our food, buying our gas. And then they leave before they truly tax all of our services. So we get all of these advantages of having these folks here. And we get all the recognition for the city of them being here. So it's a very good in my opinion, it's a very good project, a beautiful piece of property. Um, and honestly, they've been shooting uh, over the years some projects out there like Grateful, uh, Grateful Dead, <laughs> Walking Dead. <laughs> Jerry Garcia came back. He was actually in it. Um, it was kind of weird. <laughs> this is what happens when you take too much cold medicine. Is to, uh, anyway, but that's a, a, very, a very good project for us as we move forward as well. 
Now, do we have a plan? Carlton talked about it. Uh, Dan has mentioned it. Yes, we do. A couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, the Development Corporation did hire um, a consultant who came in and I think did a very good deep analysis of the community. Talked to a lot of the uh, residents, the board members, council, staff, and came up with kind of a direction. Um, it's called the, the Garner Report. I believe we have it on our website if you'd like to read it. Uh, and out of that, there's still at least, I'm going to say, four or five items that are very relevant to who we are today. This came into effect, it got done in 2019, obviously 2021, part of 22, pandemic hits. No one was doing anything. But the advantage out of that is that this plan is still valid because we didn't lose a lot of these opportunities. They just got put on pause. So it is true that one of the first things we're going to be doing is to go out and market in the film and television industry this year. We are going to go and try to get as many productions and producers to come our direction and then hopefully get more writers and actors to come and want to live in our beautiful area. Because the more we attract those folks here, the better off we're going to be to really establish that industry and get Bastrop back to being the film capital of Texas. In our business park, with the 70 acres that we have left over, the opportunities that we really want to see out here aren't just in manufacturing. Those will probably come. We may even see some logistical operations come. But if they are going to come our direction, we're also asking these businesses to bring their headquarters with them. We have a beautiful area, and it would be very nice, instead of just having the line workers, to be able to have the engineers and the top-line C-suite folks come into our city and establish that type of presence. So those are some of the things that we're going after. Um, the tech-related opportunities that are going into Austin, as you heard Carlton say, there are some that are already shutting down. Uh, part of that is they cannot find employees. Um, it has gotten very expensive in Austin. Well, if we know the growth patterns from Austin to Georgetown have gotten out of hand, um, we have not marketed ourselves yet to say, instead of being in Austin, come right here east to us. We're actually closer to the airport. It's more convenient. So we are going to be going after some of those opportunities as well. One important factor that has been talked about over the years but not pursued, but it is something that we are going to be pursuing this year, is to incubate local businesses. Now, our challenge with that is we have to have the space for it. So we do have uh, people out looking for us right now for a new headquarters operation for the EDC. And it isn't just for office space for us, but we want to make sure that we have space so we can uh, incubate these businesses, most of which are boutiques. Most of them are retail related. And we want to have a hand in helping people up with their business, not giving them a handout. So we want to have the space that we can work with them, see them on somewhat of a regular basis to be able to help them to build their business so they can graduate out into our marketplace. That is one thing that most cities do a poor job of, and that is to help their local businesses, especially on the startup side. Being so close to Austin with the entrepreneurial spirit that comes out of Austin, especially in the tech-related side, we want to show those folks that you can have that same type of opportunity down here. So that is something that we're very um, keen to be going after, but it takes a space first. So it might take us a little while to get there. In the interim, we are putting together, and we've almost finalized, a revolving loan fund for small businesses and startups. And out of this fund, which was uh, part of the money was graciously donated to us by Roscoe State Bank, and I've asked my board to match some of the funds that are coming in, but we want to be able to work with small businesses to borrow up to $10,000 from us um, that can help them in any way, shape, or form to get their business started. And by that, I mean they can use it to spend on inventory or buy signage or marketing, things that are really going to promote their business and get them going. Because most small businesses, as you're very well aware, start off by bootstrapping themselves or hitting their credit cards very hard. And if we can help them, and as I, I, I like to say, it, it, we want to give them a hand up, not a hand out. If we can do that, they will appreciate us more, and we will appreciate them more for starting their business in our community. So that's why it's a revolving loan fund, because when they pay it back, that fund continues to build itself, and then we will have those funds to continue to grow itself so we can help more and more businesses. 
So it's a start, uh, and I think it'll be a good start, and as long as we can continue to work it and promote it um, over the next years, it'll do very well for us. It'll be a really nice tool in our toolbox. Um, on the workforce training side, which would be another part of a location for us is not just to have some space where we can help to incubate businesses, but we have to look at the educational opportunities that are being missed in our community. And I can tell you that Gene has done an incredible job over the last couple of years working with the school districts, uh, school district, uh, talking to the community colleges around here, working with workforce development agencies around here about bringing in educational opportunities. So we're also looking at how can we further that? How can we make it so she's not struggling to find a space all the time? Well, is there a space out there that we can work with somebody on to lease for a cheap price or they are going to donate it to the space so we can create more and more of these educational opportunities within our community? And I'm going to have her come up and talk more about the workforce development stuff that she's been doing because it's important that you hear from her. She has the passion for this. And as we work to bring someone new on board who's going to be working with more of the small businesses, Jean really is going to take this passion and run with it. And there's going to be some things that are going to be in your world, some training as you look for employees that you're going to want to talk with Jean about to see what she can do to help bring in the right type of educational opportunities for you. So if it's okay, Jean, please. And then when we're done, by the way, we will take questions if you have any questions about what we're doing. Uh, and I will answer them as long as my voice holds out. Okay, that was Jean, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> Never heard her be so succinct. Hello, everyone again. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. We've got about, 20, uh, about 22 more minutes, so I will try to be quick but informative. Um, we have been working on workforce education. Um, literally, the first day I talked with Angela in 2015, and she found out that I was already working with the school district through my son, who was currently at Bastrop High School, she went, oh my gosh, you have to be a part of the Youth Career Day, even though you're not working for us. So I did. I jumped in, feet first, head first, no, no floaties. Um, and we have slowly, with the help and support of all of our partners, built, grown, navigated, jumped through hoops during the pandemic to continue to provide our students through Bastrop ISD the opportunity to connect with our uh, industry, all levels, uh, service industry, our manufacturers, um, other, uh, you know, related businesses within our community. And this past year, we passed the baton off to BISD to um, start kind of heading that program up the, uh, through, their, through their services. And they knocked it out of the park. We had 1,500 students. Um, I think I might have a couple of pictures here. This is, this is actually from that day um, where we brought in all age levels. Um, we had what we call the littles with the bigs, which is allowing the, the elementary students to come in and work and, and visit with all of the big equipment, the big trucks, um, really be able to engage and, and ask questions. And then <clears throat> we also had the, the intermediate and the middle school as well as the high school students. We had 75 vendors, which we are very proud to talk about because we had everyone coming to the table to talk to our students about the opportunity, where they begin while they're in school. And a lot of you may not know this, but that literally starts at our elementary age. And so we're, we're helping to help define where our students are going and most importantly, that they don't have to leave this community. We have a lot of amazing things to offer right here in our own backyard, and that continues to grow, and those opportunities at all levels continue to grow. Um, here is kind of, this is actually from a couple of years ago, but it really hasn't changed a whole lot in regards to what the demand is in our local area. So what we do is, in regards to our 
personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with our industry, we also look at things like this from a little bit more of a global standpoint from a, from a county level. Um, we're not going to be able to offer every single person a job right here in our community, but we might have something just outside of our community, but still in our county. So again, those dollars are still generating right here in, in our own area. And so we try to navigate and have the conversations to build better opportunities um, for, our, uh, for our community as a whole. So in conjunction with working with the ISD over the last eight years, this will be year nine that we have the Youth Career Day. We're also working with Austin Community College to help define and bring back the trades programming right here in our community. We're offering classes. Um, they're typically three days a week at night, so you can still work during the day and take um, upskilling or a complete career change or an open door to a new career without, you know, right out of high school and walk into um, a higher paying job. We did have our first graduating class with the trade and it was the arc welding class. We had 14 students that signed up and we graduated 14 students. We are very proud of that. Um, we're very excited about what the next classes are going to be. I'm working with them right, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> And working with ACC right now, one, to define what our next trade will be, but also what additional classroom certification programming we can start offering as well. And I can't talk about the ACC program without talking about our partnership with the city of Bastrop. Bastrop Power and Light opened up their facilities at night to allow that arc welding class to transpire. And we couldn't have done it without them. We've been looking for space, as Brett said, for numerous years. Um, it's really a great problem to have. Um, we have so many businesses that are coming in that as soon as a building is available, it's taken and we want that, right? So we, we need to be excited about that, but it does make, us, make it hard for us to find a facility to teach these classes because they do need indoor space and outdoor space. Um, with that being said as well, we are working with Community Action. Um, community Action offers a programming in a very certain kind of sector of our community and, and beyond. And we are working with them to help provide additional space as well as helping to promote what they are offering for the classes that they, that they offer. There's also a big collaboration through ACC, Community Actions, ourselves, Bastrop ISD, to connect the right people to these classes. Um, and with that being said, people like Community Actions and the Rural Workforce Solutions, who we also work with to make all of this happen, have funding. We all like funding, especially when it comes to education, because it allows our community members to possibly take those classes for free. We like free when it upskills and provides jobs and opportunity because again, ultimately we're providing a platform for our community members to be able to live here, play here, spend their dollars here, and then create that circular opportunity for them to have a better life. And so right now, those are the programs that we're working on. This particular picture is from the Community Actions first phlebotomy class and they had um, 14 people sign up and had 13 people graduate with a phlebotomy certification and are all now actively working within Bastrop County in that capacity. We're very excited about that program as well. <clears throat> And where that program will continue to go, they're actually already talking about doing a second one because of the success for this one. Um, again, I can't talk about this program without talking about where it transpired and took place. Pyrology, which is in our industrial park, many of you may know them as Deep in the Heart Art Foundry. Um, they have recently changed their name as they are growing. We did a, um, a project with them, and it was an expansion project a couple of years ago, and it was a three-phase project. They expanded their building uh, space out in our industrial park by about um, 10,000 square feet, and 
have allowed and allotted for some classroom space for us to use. We are renting it from them for 10 years to allow classes like this to transpire. And um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so we're very excited about all of the navigation, all of the partnerships to provide our community and our community uh, members the opportunity to get additional education. Um, like I said, we will continue to work with all of our groups to continue to add and provide additional opportunities. And we are looking at some potential four-year educational opportunities as well. So look forward to the future and providing more opportunities. And as Brett said, if you guys have any questions or your particular business needs, a certain type of skill set, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to connect with me. I will leave you with this, and I promise I will be done because Brett's not wrong. I could literally talk all day. Um, <clears throat> we are starting a manufacturer's task force specific to Bastrop in the Bastrop surrounding area because, as we know, everything is growing towards Austin, and that's where the majority of our big manufacturers are. And so what we're trying to do is bring them to the table, learn what their needs are from a manufacturing standpoint, give them a platform to fit within the Austin region because there is an organization called the Austin Regional Manufacturers Association that has amazing tools and amazing connectivity and amazing resources. And so what we're trying to do is really identify our manufacturers. So if you are one or if you know one, we're actually meeting right in this room this afternoon at one o'clock. Um, it'll be our first meeting. But we're, um, again, trying to really kind of gather information and resources and platforms for all of our businesses to be very successful. Thank you again for being here, and we, we look forward to doing this again with you all. The, uh, thing's on there. Uh, the, the part that Jean neglected to mention was out of the 14 graduates in the welding program, uh, we just so happened to be on site with the Boring Company uh, the day of graduation. And when they consolidated all their operations here, they were saying, gosh, we need welders, we need this, we need that. And I picked up the phone and I called Gene and I said, Gene, here, talk to him. <laughs> and I'm not sure if any of them got hired, but the fact that we could teach these positions here and get right in front of an end user of this type of labor force was, I think, important. And those will be the things that we will continue to follow up on. And as Gene mentioned, we know there are various industries around here that everybody needs some training in and they need the employee base out of. So anything that we can do to help, please reach out to us. We cannot do what we do without you. Not just your support, but your ideas, uh, your, your comments, your questions, your criticisms, because none of us are perfect. So when I say that, I do mean it sincerely. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for actually bringing that up. So we have started looking at opportunities, and, and again, the reason why we've been solely in, involved with BISD is they were our partner from the beginning. They were the one allowing us to use the facilities and create the opportunity. Um, the last two years we have, and again, COVID kind of slowed us down on that situation, but we are looking at how we can incorporate our homeschool community because it's huge. We, we have people from Lexington and Lincoln and a lot of the surrounding area that come right here to educate their kids through the homeschool network. Again, yes, we also have private schools. Um, we have charter schools. And so we, we are trying to figure out how to incorporate and provide that same platform that we've worked so hard to build with BISD in a different capacity or partnering in some capacity with the school district to allow that to transpire. We haven't forgotten about them. It, we are, it's been two, we've been two people. <laughs> We're two people. Um, but yes, now, as Brett said, you know, with, with us starting to have more staff on, on board, and I think it's going to allow us to kind of open, open that opportunity a lot bigger to, to address that. I'm going to echo just a little bit and also suggest that 
building relationships with our community partners is something that's been vital. And it's not that they haven't existed, but we just need to do it a little bit more overtly. Um, for example, you know, Becky uh, with the Chamber here supporting us um, as one of our sponsors and helping us out with this, being able to communicate to probably most of you guys about this event. It was a way that we didn't have a vehicle to do it to get in front of the right folks to get here. She did, and she absolutely said, I'll help out any way I can. So again, another community partner that we've worked well with, but now we want to work together with. So that's the important part that we have to remember out of this. Um, lastly, I, I just want to, again, I want to echo the sentiments of what economic development is. We do look at the now. We look at your businesses now. What is happening now? But our goal is to go out and get the new and next. The new and next has to support you right now. If we're not going out and getting the new and next, whatever that is, then we're failing you as a city. We're failing you as residents. Because if you're not growing, as the old adage goes for a city, you're dying. And status quo for a city equates to death. So our job is to really help you guys, as you could see, from the workforce training side to the primary job creation side. So if there's anything we can do today, now, to answer questions as we move forward, uh, feel free to ask. So I will open the floor. Yes, ma'am. So I believe the city is working on an, um, a, a broadband study. Um, I've talked to a few of the, the developers, but I'm not really diving into that because the city has, um, I believe they put money into the analysis for that. It started before I was here, so. Sorry. Um, yes, one, the city has definitely uh, taken on doing a broadband study. The county has also been working on a full coverage aspect of it for about three years now. Um, as we all know, it's very expensive. But we are looking, uh, the city and numerous others are looking at finding um, resources as well as solutions. And so the state does have some uh, funding mechanisms that because they understand obviously the pandemic really made everybody open their eyes really big. And so uh, the state has implemented some funding for that and uh, we are all trying to collaborate collectively collaborate, there we go, um, to figure out the solution for that. Yeah. So the, the challenge out of it, obviously, is that those are private enterprises. Um, there are a few cities in Texas that have looked at creating their own broadband network uh, down from the market that I was just in. Mount Bellevue is one of them that just um, just created their own internal to their city a much smaller city, a lot less infrastructure to run, uh, and a lot more deep pockets within their commercial area to offer money for that. So it is possible to do, but I think up here we do have enough providers. We just need to make sure that they're doing what they're doing. Anyone else? Oh, come on. you got to have something. I don't feel like Dan. Yes. Yes. So we have, um, as we started working with uh, Alton Butler and his uh, studio project, he has been able to bring some folks to our area that he works very well with out in L.A. Uh, one of them, uh, we can't name the organization right now, but they are a worldwide organization that works behind the scenes. And what I mean by that is these are the folks that, uh, they train and run grips, electricians, carpenters, makeup people, um, and they're even now expanding into camera operators. And what their plans are to come here is to start working within our workforce development community, our school system, so they can start teaching. And they will literally come here. They have developed a curriculum for themselves where they will teach people who want to be involved in the film and television industry. They will teach them because obviously what a great pipeline for them. They're teaching a student who's now going to go to work for them. And is now, as long as that employee is good, these folks are worldwide. They can move them anywhere uh, within their system to go and work. So yes, we are certainly looking forward to that. I also believe that once the studio gets up and running, even just outside of some of the behind the scenes things, 
we will start to see more talent that's going to come this direction. With the talent, you're going to find more of the directors who want to come this direction and acting coaches. And that gives us an opportunity to open up even through the school district, which um, Dr. Christy Lee told us last week, there are two students that in the theater program that are going to the state for, right? Nationals. Oh, nationals. Okay, so even better. Um, so we have talent here. How do we build on it and how do we attract it here? So that's one of the reasons that I think that this studio project is really important. The PR of it was great. Shooting something here is great. But these folks are willing to bring in all of these ancillary opportunities for us. Much like Carlton showed, you create 500 jobs here and it bleeds down to 1,900. This is the same thing. These aren't things that we've normally been overtly talking about, but that's what's so important about this. And I can honestly tell you, this company wants to be in our community. They want to be in the school system helping out. So that's even more important. We're not having to bribe them or entice them to do it. I would like to add to that. So um, many of you know, the EDC built 921 Main Street downtown, who currently ha happens to house a um, university college opportunity with the Art Institute. And what I want to elaborate with that is they are currently also sitting in classrooms at the existing studio on 969. And what that allows those students to do is they get to work in the classroom on their film and <clears throat> other, you know, related whether it be you know learning how to do graphic design or or whatever that's that's related to all of that, they get to work in their classroom during the day, and then as productions and other opportunities on that side are tra are transpiring, those students are actually engaged, and so it is a true going to school, learning the skill, and going right into and being able to learn it in real life on the job, and what they're. I know what they've tried to do is actually hire some of those students into internship opportunities. That that sort of like really tight knit circular engagement, that the partnerships, the relationships, the understanding of what it means to work in that environment, you you can't pay for that. You, I mean, that's just such a wonderful, beautiful kind of scenario that I wish we could build for all all aspects. Well, we're going to be respectful of time. We have a minute to go, but we will obviously be here if anybody else would uh, like to stand uh, around and chat a little bit afterwards. We'd be more than happy to. Otherwise than that, honest to God, gracious for your time this morning and your support for us. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. <laughs>